My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jim, today, special guest, man, a kayfabe lieutenant, somebody who I had in mind when we started the channel because there's very few people who can rub shoulders with like a Jordan Crane and a Jim Lee. You know what I'm saying? We've got a madman in the house. We got somebody who took Anthony Bourdain to Sizzler on television, man. <laughs> we got a dude who Howard Stern called the Prince of All Media and then adopted him. We got the man with the dirty hands, David Cho. You sure? You see my uh, ID out there? <laughs> we vetted this. We took blood samples. We talked we talked to the Japanese uh, police and got some <laughs> fingerprints. <laughs> and uh, it is confirmed. You got nothing for the cos the Ed Pisker cosplay? Oh, I got the Raiders, I got the I got the All right. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, man, it we're, it's a crazy time right now, man. Uh, there's there's a lot of turmoil. The the country is hurt and and I you know, this is a comic book podcast. Uh, a lot of our comics reading comes from the childhood. And if, if you were in high school, you know, age 15 or whatever, 1992, when the, when the um, first riots pop off, I think about like what a little dude in Pittsburgh even knew about L.A. in general and Koreans in L.A. in particular. And there's, there's four things that, that I knew. Uh, one, we have the lady, the Korean lady in the bodega, Shoots mm -hmm. the girl in the head, black girl in the head, murders her. Yeah. Get get yeah. gets off scot free. Uh, we have Ice Cube's Black Korea comes out, mm -hmm. and then we have two flicks, man, that are considered fucking super cool classics, but the depiction of the Korean store owner in Menace to Society and Do the Right Thing, as like these satellite paranoid, racist shop owners, um, mm -hmm. that's that's all that. I knew growing up about the Korean life in, in LA and you had to grow up in that. You grew up in that situation that has to make a kid pretty tough. Um, permission to get out of my Ed Pister cosplay. It's yeah. fucking hot. Yeah, right. li you live your life. I wanted, I wanted to commit to stay in a character, but it's it's very hot and you asked me some very hot questions. So I'm gonna, um, yeah, I gotta get my man bun out. And uh, uh, I don't know, man, you just fucking, threw a lot of shit on the, on the table right now. So uh, let's get into it. Um, the world is on fire right now. And at moments like this, it's like, let's definitely talk about comics. Yeah. You know, it's like um, growing up in Los Angeles uh, in the 90s. Um, oh God, this is such a... <laughs> um, the group NWA... Um, Ice Cube went solo with a uh, death certificate. And um, I think the last track on death certificate was Black Korea. And, you know, I'm a Korean American kid, first generation. My parents came here like in their late 20s. <clears throat> and to have um, I love NWA. I fucking love NWA. Um, and, and to have someone you like look up to and to be honest i like easy better than ice cube but you know ice cube he's cool man i fucking love that guy and it's it's a weird feeling when you look up to someone and then they write a song about killing your race you know and you, uh, fuck the lyrics walk it up and, down. and then we'll see you like I, I used to know it word by word because it, it like it, the song traumatized me i was like man that's ice cube saying if you follow me around your liquor store, I'm going to fucking kill you. And then, um, you know, I think about the medium of comics, right? I grew up in L.A. It's uh, Meltdown, Golden Apple. And, uh, and you know, like, you know, I talked to you at first time like a week ago, right? And since then, the world's exploded since then. And you go, hey, I'd love to talk to you on the show. And I... For me, I, I haven't done interviews in a long time. Yeah. Years. And so the, the timing couldn't be more awkward. It's like, we're going to sit down right now. I mean, there's like fucking people looting outside, like right down the street from here. Like it, it's, and uh, and it's like a, a trauma repetition, re repetition. It's like, um, where did I go? You know, you're talking about 92. I was 15 years old. Right. I mean, that just imprinted. The world is not safe. It's not safe to be, you know, everything I know in a moment could be taken away. And so to just 
bury my head in fantasy in a comic was that's it you know i mean I could talk to you guys right now for easily like 30 hours about everything comics. Like you guys are doing God's work, like not even exaggerating right now. Like I, I, when I hear you guys talking about, and you guys are like name dropping names that I haven't heard in like 20 years, like, and, and you're talking about it. Like, you know what it feels like? It feels like when I was in uh, union square, like a few years ago and I'd been in Africa, i have been out of the country for a while. And I, I said, you know what? I'm back in America. I want to go see a movie. And I went to the movie theater and I look at the marquee and it's, I go, is that fucking Aquaman? <laughs> you know, it's even one of the Justice League movies. It's like, okay, I don't know if that's going to be any good. Thor? Thor? Yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy? You're talking about the four for a dollar bin. Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy, Jim Valentino, one of the worst fucking comic books ever is like the number one blockbuster and i'm sitting there in union square new york city being like did i come back to america and like i I get it if you make another batman movie i get it if you make superman guardians of the galaxy horseshit aquaman the worst character that dc has talks to fish thor nobody nobody reads thor only like the only time anyone was mildly interested in thor was when there was the horse looking motherfucker beta ray bill but besides that nobody reads thor nobody reads fucking aquaman and nobody reads guardians of the galaxy and there they are boom in fucking middle and like people know who these people are and i go i think i'm living in an alternate reality right now and that's the closest feeling that i've had to listening i was like did these guys just talk about wizard magazine for two hours and i was glued to, i was like this is fucking mental so for me you guys are drugs to me right now so i was like you guys want to talk to me fuck yeah let's do it let's do it in the middle of and this ain't the la rights now this is like the world rights they're yeah, fucking moving and writing in berlin and i mean it is insane like it's fucking yeah, I could completely disassociate right now and talk about Asgard and wh- wherever the fuck you guys want to go. <laughs> cool. Let's let's do that then. Uh, you bring up Wizard Magazine and in Slow Jams, there's that there's that one issue that you're jerking off to, and <laughs> with Gen Thirteen on the cover, and that issue is the one that had the Cubert School article. And when I was a little dude seeing that shit, I carried that issue around with me for like my entire high school life because I'm like, this is where I'm going to go. I reread that article a million times. 1999, you get slow jams and then you see my, my, uh, my, the most important issue of wizard <laughs> sullied by fucking David Cho, man, because he's jerking off the Fairchild and free fall. It's my pleasure, man. It's my pleasure. Um, I had, a, uh, I've been, I was a really horny teenager, you know, like for me, um, when I see like kids today, like kids that are 15, and you know it's not it's the same dynamic as like for me it was like stealing uh playboys from the newsstand and then reading a comic and like those things sort of went together and now it's more like play video games all night and then switch back and forth between Pornhub. um so i was, I was like a super horny kid and I, I i had a i lived i have two brothers and and my grandmother lived with us and we lived in a tiny house so I can safely say every member besides my grandmother had caught me jerking off in the house. <laughs> and, and it was, um, I don't know, if, like every time I say that, right? Like I, that's a, like a story that I can just tell now and I don't get embarrassed at all. But that was at 15, so shameful. It was such a shameful, painful experience that my little brother had walked in and I had, you know, it was the one day that he was at camp and everyone was out of the house, which was super rare. And I have I had, um, you know how artists have like the flat file with like National Geographic, their, their uh, what do you call it? I've heard you guys say morgue. it before, the, the morgue. Um, I, I had a different name for it, but I can't. Well, I had that for porn. So I had a, I had a yellow pages uh, telephone book and I had like pages of like a really hot chick that someone drew in a comic book or a lingerie thing and I, and I hid it in there. So it just looked like a phone book. And um, the day like, that the stars aligned and everyone was out of the house. I laid every page out and I took all my clothes off. And before that, it was always like, I have to like, you know, there's only one bathroom between three brothers. So it's like, uh, and, and my brother walked in and I had never felt shame on that level. And I come from a super religious family. And then like my dad found it and uh, you know, he confronted me, you know, I just felt so embarrassed. And, you know, as a 15 year old, my, my, 
uh, ability to uh, express my emotions is basically just hate or anger. Like there's not that much range. And so to, to get caught jerking off by mom, dad, brother number one, brother number two, I just felt judged. I felt embarrassed. I felt like I was going to go to hell. And I didn't know what to do with that. And so I just put it into comics. And this is before I knew about the whole, I don't even know if there's a name for it, but like all the comic artists that draw their dicks and show themselves jerking off, Joe Matt, Chester Brown, like, and so I just drew it because I, I didn't know what else to do with it. I was so lost and I was like, I'm gonna, I've already been humiliated. I've already been embarrassed. I don't know what else to do with this. I'm gonna just gonna dive into it. And so I, I, I wrote the story first. I was like, how long do I really think about Fairchild from Gen 13, uh, uh, Campbell drawing? Not that long, like just a few, okay, write that down. That girl today that, and, and I just wrote down how much I jerk with the number of seconds and just to write that out was enough for me. Like it was in my journal. I was like, that's, oh my God, that's, it's out there. I, I was able to exercise that demon and now I can, you know, and then I was, uh, I don't know, 16 or 17 then. And I remember going to art school. I went to art school in Oakland at a place called CCAC. I went there for a year and a half before I dropped out and I took a creative writing class there. And, uh, you know, I was older now, I was 21. And uh, I found that thing. I found that story that I had written when I was 16. And I was like, you know, I, I, I like it when it hurts. I like shame. I'm gonna read this super embarrassing thing. And this is art school, right? So I read this story in front of all these, like the, 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 the cast of characters from Dan Klaus's Art School Confidential. I mean, they're all there. It's like the feminist, the lesbian, the the Conan looking guy, they're all there. And I'm sitting there going, and I jerked off to you for like 30 seconds. And I jerk, you know, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sitting there re ready for my mom and dad to be like, you're going to go to hell. And I get the bravo, bravo. And I go, what? This is crazy. Like I'm getting like applauded for like writing about the most shameful experience of my life. And so, you know, I'm as someone who's like young and insecure and not sure of the world, I said, wow, I got some uh, affirmation for this. I got some praise for this. Why don't I turn it into a comic? So I turned it into a zine and, um, and uh, Jordan Crane saw it. And he's like, this is, this is fucking amazing, man. And uh, I remember I made it um, with a color, color uh, copy um, that, you know, those were like a dollar 50 at Kinko's back then. I stole them <laughs> and then I made these zines and uh, I made like, I made like 50 of them or something. And I, and I um, snuck into, I would always sneak into Comic-Con as Jim Lee or uh, <laughs> Jason Shiga or Derek Kerr, any, any Asian, Ron Lim. Like I just figured, you know, I, I got into comics, not during the Stan Lee era. I got, so I thought, you know, my first was like McFarlane, Jim Lee, those guys. So then when I heard that Stan Lee is like the guy that invented all this, I just thought that that was uh a guy related to Jim Lee. I thought he was Korean. I thought Stan Lee was Korean. And then it wasn't until Wizard Magazine is that what I knew all their faces looked like. So, you know, I, sn I snuck into Comic-Con with like a Jim Lee fake press pass and and um, I just set up in like the small press area and, and Jordan Crane saw that and he's like, this is fucking unbelievable. And it was like so shitty to me because it was like Xeroxed and glued together with a glue stick and I was cutting shit and Sharpie marker. And, um, yeah, and he's like, he's like, I'm, I'm gonna print this in my in my thing. Non, he had an anthology called Non. It was like Brian Ralph, Jordan, and all these guys. And you know, I, it was like, oh, I, I feel like, um, I feel like I belong. You know, I felt like uh, part of something. You know, and then, um, you know, my 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 experience with comics was Tunnel Vision, GI Joe. That was it. I had GI Joe action figures. I shoplifted GI Joe action figures. So I'd either just get the GI Joe, it was 75 cents back then, I'd just get the GI Joe comic from the spin rack at 7-Eleven, or I'd go to the Golden Apple that doesn't exist, it's on Pico, I'd ride my bike there. And I, it was overwhelming for me. I'd just walk in and I'd see the Batman and this, you know, the X-Men and everything, but I just, I would just go, is the new GI Joe out? And if it wasn't, I'd just ride back home. It's just GI Joe and Garbage Pail Kids, that was my life. Until the fucking 
Venom McFarlane cover and the Wolverine, um, you know, claws with the Hulk reflection. And, and I remember like walking in slow motion being like, why is there so many fucking lines on this guy's face? Like, why is, you know, I, I never, I, I was like, it, it, it did something to me. It was almost like, um, it, it felt almost exactly like the first time I saw pornography. I was like this, like my head exploded. And I go, I don't know who this Spider-Man is, but he's black and he's muscular and he has fangs. And I'm like, oh man. And so I got into com like superhero comics from G.I. Joe that way. And I always remember this golden apple because they have the, uh, the expensive comics up on the wall. And I always remember seeing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles first print, or it was like first or second printing. And it was like 400, 300 bucks. And that just blew my mind because I'm a kid who can barely get scrounged 75 cents for a GI Joe. And, and it looked like newsprint. And, you know, I'd ask the guy, I was like, well, what is that? You know, and you guys remember that time? It was like cold blooded chameleon commandos, adolescent hamsters, like everyone was ripping it off. There was like teenage samurai hamsters and gophers and everyone tried it. And they were like, oh, they were like on their seventh printing now. And I remember looking at that wall as like a little kid, you know, this, I was probably like eight or nine, just being like, fuck, man, I hope, you know, I hope I can get on that wall one day if, if, to, to make a new, you know, something printed and then it would go on a wall like that would be so amazing, you know. So after, after the non came out with Jordan. Um, David, you know, can I, I can I ask yeah, you? Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, I, I could. <laughs> oh no, this is great. But uh, I, I have a question about the aesthetics of slow jams and a, and a lot of your comics from from non okay. and other places. You do a lettering thing that's very much like you described paste up, and it's like yeah. I assume you're printing those out and then you know cutting up your lines of text and and assembling them on a page somehow. Where does that come from? Because that seems like more of a zine technique than what I would see in a lot of comics at the time. Um. I'll just start by saying I fucking hate talking about art because then um, it sounds like uh, it, at, whatever. I'm just going to say, you know, like I, I would see like, um, like the best example of um, comic book lettering, you know, like, uh, or inking, like something like Charles Burns or something. And it would just blow me, or even Jordan Crane, like, I, you know, when I'd see his originals. It, and something in, happened to me when I was a kid, which was, you can't be left-handed. You know, I know they say left-handed people are more uh, creative and whatever, but as a Korean, um, it's like bad luck or something. So my grandma and my mom and my dad, they would notice I would grab for things with my left hand. And um, so they would wrap my hand in saran wrap and then I would chew it off. And I don't know if any other left-handers out there would relate, or either of you left-handed? No, no. So I would, you know, you, you write uh, left to right in, in, in America, right? So I, I would sit down to draw, as this is like as a kid, like I would have the picture in my mind of like a perfect kind of drawing, you know? And it, I, would, I would be hand lettering and it would be perfect. And at the last minute, because I'm going this way, I'd smudge it. I'd be like, fuck, man. And, and you could imagine later in life how liberating it was to see like a Bill Sienkiewicz, you know, because I'm like, okay, cool. Like, it doesn't have to. But in my mind, a good drawing meant clean lines, you know, like this. And so, I, you know, I, I saw an episode where you, you were like redrawing spawn pages and stuff. Right. Uh, Ed, like, that, that's me. So I, I, I have an ability... My, my mutant special power is I can see anything from like a McFarlane to Charles Burns or Dan Klaus or Adrian Tomine or it doesn't matter. Like I can study it and um, and then I can do it. And it just it, 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 I, I guess that sounds like bragging, but I, I'm just telling you what I got, what I can do. Like I can draw I can ape any style I can draw in any style. And it, the thing about that is it takes me a long time and it's fucking boring. So when I sit down to the letter slow jams, I'm like, this is what I think it should look like. These are the comic books I like. And then I start writing it and then I get so bored and I have to keep up with the pit. Like I have all the classic art artist Simpsons, Simpsons uh, symptoms. I have ADD, I'm bipolar, I have all those things. So 
I'm I'm like just picture me like writing it like with my my little like artist supplies my little pen and I'm like Argh! and and um I'll add to to that like slow jams is a story about like just unrequited stalking passion and it's it's a creepy book and the first half of it I wasn't in a, I I didn't have a girlfriend I had never had a girlfriend and then the second half um, I had a girlfriend and it was super weird because I, you know, I, I didn't know how to be a boy. I was like 23 at the time. I didn't know how to be like with an adult relationship and, and she'd want to spend time with me. And she's like, what, what are you drawing over there? And she'd come and she'd look and she's like, I'm a real like human girl that like wants to fuck you and like spend time with you. And you're drawing a comic about being obsessed with another girl. And that's why the, you know, I, I meet other artists later and they're like, that's amazing how slow jam starts drawn really well and then it gets shittier to like the pace of the story and it's genius how you did that i go no that's i had a, i was living with a crazy bitch at the time and she was like begging me to you know so i rushed through it and so i know that's a really long answer to your question but i i just i i, I do things and then people go oh like you know was that a design choice but for me my add or whatever you want to call it i just maybe there was there's a page out there somewhere where it's lettered perfectly and then i just lost interest and then i was like you know what i already wrote the story out why don't I just fucking cut it out and um and so my um attention span or my impatience my character defect of not being a patient person um is pretty much i mean that's a that's a great question jim because that that extends to like why i never did comics at all after slow jams I well just... you know i i mentioned it too because i found slow jams in 2000 it was reviewed in uh in the comics journal would do like their annual issues like the best of 1999 and several mm -hmm. of them it was it would be a, a relatively small list there was almost a consensus but right. several people would name slow jams as their favorite comic and so i was lucky to find it at phantom of the attic in oakland here and uh and it really spoke to me but aesthetically you did a lot in that comic that i had not seen before in comics and so it expanded my landscape as to like this looks cool why don't people do this? And, you know, and right. so it kind of gave me permission and, and some ideas of my own. So I'm interested yeah. in that part and some of the aesthetic yeah, well, choices uh, because it did look different. I had never even heard the word mixed media until I got to art school. And uh, for me, when I listen to you guys and I'm like, you know, I just I, I'm coming fresh off the Mark Millar interview and. Um, I go, what is this thing like? We're fucking grown men right now talking. You guys got boxes of comics like why? Like, I, why do people keep coming back to comics? And I'm like, because you can fucking do anything. You can fucking do anything. Like, it's literally like the last frontier, you know? And so as a lost, during that age, you know, in my early 20s, my late teens, and just being lost and skating around LA doing graffiti, and no, just knowing that I can draw, like that's like the one area where people are like, oh, he's not that good at school. He doesn't know how to play sports. He's not good at getting girls. But like, man, when he draws, he can really, I was like, but what does that mean? You know, because I love comic books. I, it's my favorite art form. I love graffiti. That's not a real job until I turned it into one. It, it, these things aren't like, and then the pressure of being like a second, you know, first generation immigrant, you know, um, or, 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 or son of immigrants, it's like, we we escaped war, we got on a fucking boat and came here so you can be a graffiti artist? What? Like, it just, you know, so it's just coupled with what you're saying, the LA riots and, like, the racism towards, like, fuck you, you gook, you chink, and it wasn't like, I didn't grow up with people, like, ah, that's not true, I, I did get beat up once. <laughs> Thanks, I, I pushed that one back into the memory. Uh, but but it was hard it was a hard it was very difficult and so i said well here's the one place where i can find positivity and i went to my first comic con in san diego uh it was my i was eight, 19 or 20 something like that and i'd seen um my first original comic book pages with the white out and i was like oh fuck like that's what it looks like and there was a giant piece by, uh, um, I don't know how they split up the art chores, but it was John J. Muth and uh, uh, Kent Williams' Havoc and Wolverine Meltdown. And it's like Wolverine with like this kind of hair and, you know, his forearms are like Popeye forearms. And it's like, oh, uh, I was like, hell yeah, 
fuck yeah. Like, and um, I was like, I, I felt like that. I'd never seen a comic book like that. I was like, what is that? That looks, and I was like, you can do that. You know, sometimes a lot, a lot of times in life, you just need someone else to be like, give you permission, right? Like you can do that. And I was like, that looks so shitty and awesome at the same time. And, and literally the same week, you know, that had an effect on me. And then the literally the same week I was back in LA, you know, I had my black portfolio case and I had a lot of, I was a very, very angry, yet very cocky kid, you know? So I, I rode my skateboard down La Brea and I went into every art gallery, like trying to show my stuff. And it was like rejection, rejection, rejection. And then I skated into this gallery that's not there anymore called the Mary Karnowski gallery, Kent Williams solo show. So I had just seen his art in San Diego and like a comic book, like complete nerd out. Like, you know, this is when there was no women at comic con. And, and then now, you know, I'm at this Kent Williams solo show opening and it's exactly the same style of painting, but no Wolverine, you know, it's like Egon Sheila, like this kind of shit. And I'm like $20,000 for a paint. Like, and I was like, and I, I, I talked to him for a second. He was, you know, he had women around him and fancy Hollywood people. And I, I was like, you can do both. And he's like, yeah, why not? And I was like, Oh my God, like, this is, this is amazing. And so I, I just, um, you know, this is my aesthetic coming out from like these kind of things, you know, and it's like, like, why not, you know, why not? I have my interest in art is so vast. Like I love comics. I love graffiti. I love fine art. I love abstract art. I love, I love it all. So, you know, I, I, I would, I, you know, and this is later getting into like the more independent indie stuff, but I just was like, there's things I've seen in TV shows. There's things I've seen in, like my first masturbation scene that I've ever saw was in uh, There's Something About Mary, right? When he jerks <laughs> off before. And, and I had never seen that in a movie before. And that was literally roll on the floor laughing. Like I remember falling into the aisle and I was like, the guy has cum in his hair. Right now it's like, nobody cares, right? All those movies that came out, American Pie, fucking like, that was like shocking because it had not touched that. But in comics, you know, when you guys, Johnny Ryan or Ivan Brunetti or like Joe Matt, it's just like, what, you know, Robert Crumb, you know, like it's the last, I'm, it, it, it feels to me, I, you, you, sorry, I'm getting a little stuck right now because I'm, I'm remembering the feelings I had at that age of like seeing, going to a comic con and then seeing those pages in real life, like the actual original pages and then seeing like, and then knowing my skill level, I'm like, fuck, I could paint like that. It would just take me the next seven years, you know? And I'd, and I'd start to meet, oh, that's what, you know, Jim Lee looks like. That's what this, and I'd start to meet my favorite comic book artists and they all, they all had this horrible, like hunchback. Yeah, I know and it will. <laughs> and they'd have like, you know, they, they look like uh, like uh, Bernie Wrightson drawings. They, they were <laughs> pale, and, and I was like, I, I know I can do that. I just don't know if I have the patience to do that. Like, it takes, like, I can appreciate comics and the people that, like, take 10 years to do, like, one comic and all that. But I was like, I, I, I felt like, um, the, you know, not to, you know, just with the jerk-off scene from Slow Jams, which people liked, I, I just, I had so many ideas that I just wanted to, and, and, and the thing that not to harp, keep harping on the LA rights is I thought I was going to die. Like I thought I was going to die and like people go, Oh, and then you didn't die. And then you move on. But that's not my understanding of, of how trauma works. Like trauma, it stays with you. So anytime I did everything from that on, I started hitchhiking. I started like putting myself into really dangerous situations. I, 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 I went to Africa. I went to the Gaza strip because I, I was like, go for broke every time. And that led to me being like a really sick gambler and all these things. But that, that's why when I put out a piece of work, I'm less uh, interested in it looking perfect. Whereas I, I would meet my favorite artists, right? Like I'd, I'd go to like James Jean's house and as a fan and I'd be like, whoa, dude, like those paintings don't even look like a human did it. And then I look at a sketchbook and I'm like, this is like way better than, you know? And I'm like, wait, if I like artists like imperfect, sketchy, fast shit, 
I'm just going to guess like most people would like that over, you know, because I would have like one page in slow jams that I'd like render in this. And I'm like, it's going to take me forever. And like, you sort of lose the energy of what I was feeling. Like I was literally trying to draw at the pace of my, myself thinking. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, talk about uh, delusions of grand grandeur. I, I had Jordan Crane who like, I was like, man, this guy is fucking awesome. And then um, to hear about the Zira grant with Peter Laird, I mean, it was like full circle. I was like, man, I used to be a kid and look at that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And that's the guy that's funding the, my, my, my comic. And, and the thing was, I didn't get it. I applied for it and I didn't get it. And um, I was like heartbroken because in my mind, I was like, oh man, I'm so fucking cool. I'm dope, you know? And then I remember getting the rejection letter and then someone, I forgot, a friend of mine just said, well, why don't you just try it again? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you didn't get it this time. Try again next year. How many comic book artists do you think are out there? You know, just keep trying. I had a friend who tried five times and got it. And so I got it the next year and um, it was Scott McCloud that was on the jury. And um, so then, then things started moving quickly. I remember, I remember I didn't know anything about printing or distribution. And the way it works is if you win the zero grant, they pick like three or four guys and you get five grand and they, you just send them the pay stubs and they cover it, you know, but I didn't know how to, I didn't know anything. So I, I said, can you guys just send me the five grand? And I, I, I promise you, I won't spend it on drugs and whores. Like I'll definitely <laughs> use it on. And they're like, Dave, it doesn't really work that way. You, you know, and they gave me some resources. Here's like web core printing. And here's, you know, they gave me the list and I was like, you guys don't understand. I'm like a fucked up person. I'm very disorganized. I, and I wrote this long letter. I swear to you on my fucking life, just give me the money. I sounded like a drug addict and I promise you I'll spend it on the comics. And I did, I, you know, I, and, and so I got the check and then I ordered the books and I had Jordan help me with laying it out. And the, you know, it was like the different color inks and, and then it shows up and I have, I think 3000 copies of slow jams in boxes in my house as furniture. Like I don't, I'm, I take five to Golden Apple. I'm like, can you guys sell this? I took some of the guests on at Meltdown. He's like, yeah, I'll take two. And I'm like, okay, seven down. Like, <laughs> And I didn't know how to market a book like that. And so I started, um, I started uh, just sending it to magazines. Like I sent it to Rolling Stone and I would find out who the art director is. And, you know, I, for two things to try to get illustration work and to see if they would write a review. And then, uh, this woman, Claudine Coe, who worked at Jane Magazine at the time, wrote a blurb this big of like, this punk rock skate graffiti kid did this comic. And it's like the best thing ever. And then all of a sudden, I was getting all these letters from women and I'd be going to the post office every day to just send one copy, one copy, one copy. And um, and then that year, what's, what's the Comic Con that's in Bethesda? Or was in Beth is it SPX? SPX. Okay. I, that's, so I was, I got invited to SPX. And, um, and, and I was being nominated for best newcomer comic book artist or it was something like that. And I was new to this world, you know? And in my mind as a young person, I was like, man, I'm a fucking pimp. I got the Zira grant. That's my hero, Peter Laird. Scott McCloud was on the fucking jury. That's the guy that writes about comics and he's saying I, I, I'm the chosen one. And then I get there and I meet Neil Gaiman and he's the speaker and he's like, yeah, I gave him a copy. And he's like, dude, this is amazing. And then, uh, uh, talk about holding a grudge. So that year, it was uh, best new uh, newcomer artist David Cho for Slow Jams, uh, Craig uh, Thompson for Goodbye Chunky Rice, and Frank Cho for Liberty Meadows, which to this day everyone still thinks I'm related to him. And um, and I had it. Like every fucking person there was like, "Dude, this is the best fucking thing." And you know, I was I was taking it in like as like a fucking weird reject kid that had no. No, nothing that good happened to him his whole life and everyone's starting to tell me like you're the you're the guy you're the one i was like i'm gonna win this shit and then and the winner this year for the best is frank cho and who's on the jury frank cho i'm like what the fuck is that shit all about you know um but you know i let it go and I, i've never met the guy i'm sure he's a nice guy he's, he, he does some good avengers work but um <laughs> but yeah i mean it, it was uh it, I, I just thought like I thought I was going to be the, the guy, you know, I, I have a, I have a really good uh, Jim Lee story. Cause like as image formed as, as I was a kid, um, 
I, I just kept drawing Spawn. I just drew the fucking cape and like, I was, I'm gonna out McFarlane McFarlane, you know? Oh, how does a human being, the chains, the gravity, the proportions, it does, and I was like, I'm gonna go next level. And I made the cape like, and I'm sitting in line and, and I'm getting to express all the anger and fear and all those emotions you have as a teenage boy in Spawn's chains and his capes. And I'm drawing the craziest shit and I'm waiting at line at Golden Apple for the, you know, Todd signing. And it's the, the introduction of uh, image, you know, Spawn is like the flagship title. There's a line that's snaking around like 10 blocks. There's police, there's helicopters. I'd never seen anything about it. And then it was like everyone in line was like part of this comics tribe, you know? Hey, look at what that fucking kid's doing over there. And I was like, yeah, motherfucker. You know, and I'm drawing Spawn. And because of Wizard Magazine, I knew what Jim Lee looked like. I knew what he looked like. And so a car pulls up and I see this guy with a baseball cap come out and he starts walking. Fuck, that's Jim Lee. And I go, hey, hey, bro, can you hold the line for me? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I take my comic because I want to go show, I want to show him. And I run up to him and no one's bothering him. And he's got his hat low. And I say, hey, Jim, look at my spawn drawing. And he's like, oh, man, that's, that's pretty good. And then some kid in the back goes, that's fucking Jim Lee. And he just gets mobbed. And I was like, this, like, this is my introduction to like, I, you know, I didn't understand that this was a special moment. I thought like being a comic book artist was like being a rock star, even though that had never occurred before. And he got mobbed and secured, like he was like Elvis, is, you know, like a beetle. Like he, they put the thing around him. And, and at, at that moment, I was like, fuck, I know. I know what I got to do in this life. I got to be a comic book artist. I got to be like Kent Williams, Jim Lee. You know, I had all these different influences. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it, was, it was crazy. And so I did the one comic book. And this is, I remember 1999 is when I left LA because I did one last mural on a Sunset and Fountain. And I remember getting a call I'm telling you stories because I'm, I'm trying to put you guys in the mindset of like how things were unfold, like to just do your first comic and then get nominated for best new thing. And, and I remember getting a call from a woman named Mira, who was, I think, uh, Jay Lee's girlfriend at the time and um, uh, uh, an editor at Marvel. And she said, you know, I, I heard about this comic Slow Jams and I heard that, you know, you're like this, you're not really a... Um, a comic book artist you're more like a graffiti artist and I said yeah I, I do all those things and she goes you know we're we're thinking of doing like a uh, an adult more like street contemporary version of the x-men called nyx and I said okay and she's like would you be interested in doing the art for that and I was like fuck I was like I ain't even fucking trying and these fuckers are coming <laughs> to, you know I'm not even trying I'm like getting x I'm like not even I was like 21 at the time I'm like I'm getting x-men I'm like everything's lining up for me. Like my life is coming together. And, and so they put me with this writer, Brian Wood, great guy. And it was like rogue. And I remember getting the script of like, this is, we want it drawn in an urban style, whatever that means. And it's going to be X-Men in like New York, you know, tagging and drug, you know, it was like a, and so I, I, they're like, don't tell anyone yet. And I started drawing the characters, you know, I wish I, I was at home right now. Cause I have, tons of shit I could send it to you guys later so I start drawing this book and this is like 1999 2000 era so the internet was around but I wasn't like I, I didn't know how to use it I was barely ever on it so I'm at my house just shit eating grin I'm like my life couldn't be more perfect when I do like weird indie comics it wins awards when I fucking don't even try Marvel comes knocking at my door like my life is fucking dope and I get a call from a friend who's like into comics and he goes, Hey, um, didn't you say you were drawing some kind of weird X-Men thing? And I said, yeah, yeah. Brian Wood. And he's like, yeah, I just saw on the Marvel like message board that it's, uh, it's, uh, Joe Quesada and Bill Jam Jamus or something like that. Like it wasn't me. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, that I saw the book that you said you're working on, but you're not, your name wasn't on there. And I said, what? And this is me just like sitting in my house. So I call the Marvel offices and, you know, no one picks up and I'm like, Hey guys, do I have this job or not? Cause I have the check from you guys and I got the contract and I'm working on this fucking thing and, and no one would call me back. And then my fucking K rage just exploded. I was like, 
what kind of person hires someone and doesn't even tell them that they've been laid off or gets a phone call being like, hey, we're going in a different direction. I'm still sitting in my fucking shitty ass black mold uh, Oakland apartment with like crackheads outside drawing this fucking thing. And and they don't you don't have the courtesy to fucking even tell me. So this was my first experience of um, I meant I told you guys I'm bipolar, right? <laughs> so I write like this rant of just fuck Marvel, uh, fuck Mark Bagley. I've never met the guy before. Like, fuck, uh, you know, Joe Quesada. I mean, it was the most, like, homophobic, racist. You know, I try to inject some humor into it, but it's, it's you know, I'm like a... Uh, I, I just didn't know how to express myself. And, and, I, and I just said, how can I hurt these people that I've never met before? And I just took a machine gun and I was like, so I don't know, I'm sure you could still find it online somewhere. So I write this, I'm writing it like, I don't know how to type, so I'm writing it like this. I'm like, fuck you, Marvel, and you stupid fucking, you know. And then I didn't know how, who to send it to because no one would call me back there. So I went on a website and I found every Marvel at email and I sent it to everybody. And then, you know, less than a day later, everyone was like, hey, uh, you're like in a lot of trouble. And I was like, what? And then I saw that everyone in every, um, comic book creator that I'd ever met in my life or not met um, worshipped was like like uh, Brian Bendis was like this guy is just committed career suicide he's like uh, uh, he's like that singer that sings circle in the sand that one hit, like you know they, they were just I was horrified I, I was I, I thought I would write that I didn't know what I was thinking I wasn't thinking I just sent it and uh you know, and to this day, I've never met Joe Quesada. I've never met, you know, I, Joe, if you're listening, I, this is a formal apology. I, you know, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I was like not in my right mind and that, that wasn't cool. Um, but I wasn't in the right mind to apologize then. I was like, fuck, you know, and it, and it felt, um, it felt like, uh, it felt like the shame again. You know, like uh, getting caught jerking off, like peep the ice cube telling me fuck Korean people. It's like I'm chasing it. You know, when people when 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 I would date a girl and she would keep going back to her shitty ex boyfriend, I'd be like, why do you do that? Why do you keep going back to these painful experiences? When I sat there and I opened my computer and I saw that I'd gone viral, not in a good way, and Brian Bendis and you know I, I can't remember every. It was like a long list of people just being this guy just committed career suicide who the fuck is he even no one's even seen his shit like he's he's dead in the water man fuck this guy and i was like oh my god it felt like all those things again i'm like man i'm fucking chasing the hurt man i'm, I'm like living in the shame and uh and i remember I, I was i was so fucking like out of my mind back then like i remember going to my first um ape alternative press expo in san jose and they would have these panels with like um like in these rooms with like the glass and i remember i just i wanted to shake people and be like dude fuck like dude do the craziest fucking comics ever like don't do the same shit like fucking like and it doesn't have to be you jerking off but like take comic like you could do anything and i didn't know how to say that so like almost like in a fake wrestling way i remember there was a panel and i hope i get this right it was the guy who does scud yeah. um honan vasquez Johnny the Homicidal Maniac, Mike Alred, and I think Evan Dorkin, and they were doing a panel in one of these rooms. And I just, I love and hate, you know, I have this love-hate relationship with art and artists and comics and, you know. And so I remember them like, excuse me, and asking inking questions. And I just, I, I felt rage. And I took my friend who was, you know, in on the joke with me and I slammed his body against the glass and I was like, fuck you, why did you open, open my Hulk 181? I told you to leave it in the... <laughs> and I started screaming at the top of my lungs, like, like, and he's like, fuck you, man, that ain't even his first appearance, it's Hulk 180, last frame, it's a silhouette of Wolverine. And we were like in it, and like, I remember Mike Alred or Evan Dorkey came out, I was like, what are you guys doing? And I screamed and they're like, dude, it's fucking words on paper. It's print, it's, it's ink on paper. It's not worth killing each other over. And I go, you just don't care about comics. And, and so that's just the kind of energy I had. And I remember going to, to Comic-Con and I would, 
you know, I, I remember meeting Ron Lim for the first time. And Ron Lim, he's like, I know him because his comics were in the four for a dollar section. And it was X Mutants, EX. And it was them. And I would see him and I would just grab him and hug him and be like, I fucking love Ron Lim. Ron Lim's a fucking pimp. And people were like, who is this guy? And, and, and then I saw Jim Lee once. And that was my first WonderCon or something. And same thing, like line just snaking around the whole building. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to wait in that line. And I remember, um, I think of the, the Bible story. I think it's Zacchaeus, like waiting in this tree to look at look for Jesus. I'm like just waiting for an inn. And I, I saw like a lull for a second. I just jumped in and I threw like a zine and, uh, and slow jams at Jim. I said, hey, Jim, love your work. And I just threw it. And I like ran before anyone could yell at me. And he like, he like looks at it and goes, Dave Cho. Dave Cho? And I said, yeah, I go, you're the guy that fucking took, like, took on all of Marvel? And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's me. He's like, here, come here, give me your number. And I was like, what? Yes. I was like, fucking self-destructing is cool. It works. And, you know, I'm friends with Jim now because of that. I'm like, I don't know if Jim would have ever known who I was or, or taken an interest in me if I didn't fucking, like, suicide bomb myself. Um, so, I, sorry, guys. I know I'm, I, I'm, I'm really excited to be talking to you guys. So, I, I, I'm just ranting right now. It's but. real fun. And, and I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, I watched uh, the Dirty Hands documentary again yesterday just in preparation for this. And I made sure to freeze frame the section where you're at some Comic-Con and there's Jim Lee holding up a giant mural of, like, the family. And it's a, it's a, it's a David Cho piece, you know? So, it's like you freeze frame and you do that, like, NCIS law and order, like, <laughs> like enhanced resolution, <laughs> zoom in on that shit. Because you don't see that yeah. piece. Oh, you can't find that piece, like in a magazine or anything man i was like studying that it was super cool but you know what uh dave another thing that uh, i sort of uh forgot but was reacquainted to when we watched it when i watched the documentary I fucking love that you guys are taking notes right now by the way <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it, it's so funny i fucking love that shit we we always get because we are in the privileged position to be the first in on the jump of something so so uh when we're recording very often take down you know the comics that the cartoonist will suggest so that we get it before we put the video out <laughs> and then it's a thousand dollars on eBay or whatever. But, um, I just wanted to bring up like the, the, the hustler illustration stuff is, is worth noting because, okay. uh, when like that period of time that, that art director was insanely hip and, and you guys know this guy, Josh, Josh Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know this guy? That's awesome. Uh, but, um, you know, the w WT Nelson, the art director over there at Hustler, he, yeah. he, he had guys like, like Klaus doing like the letterhead, mm -hmm. um, piece, man. Coop was doing art in there. Yeah. And m like my very first work was my first offer was in there until he found out I was 16 years old and was like, <laughs> and, and was like, why didn't you say something? I said, you didn't ask. <laughs> and, and my dad's name is Ed Piscor. So I was like, can, why can I just use my dad's like social security number and get, get paid? And he's like, just because you asked me now, I have to say no. Oh man. You know what I'm saying? But you were, uh, you were a part of that pedigree and, and wow, that, yeah, that was, that was a really, um, strange, I mean, it's it's strange to sort of to put it in the context like like uh, when I talk to my therapist and and she tells me you have to perform some sort of action to get drugs to go see like a donkey fucking a woman in, in Tijuana or like vices in general you had to leave your home to go pursue that you want to do drugs you got to and, th and the fact that now your phone is a casino, drug dealer, stripper, like it's all just right there. It, it's, it wasn't like that, right? And so I told you guys, I was, I was sending copies of Slow Jams out to like different art directors and, and uh, you know, I would see a Kent Williams, you know, painting in Rolling Stone or, or Playboy or something. And, um, I was like, man, maybe maybe this could be a source of income and get my get my art out there and I could become an illustrator. And I just got, you know, I have them all still. I have rejection letters from all those places. They're like, it looks like, you know, you got some promise, but, you know, not not for us. And um, I go to my first. Um, I think it was Ape again, not the one where I was throwing my friend against the wall, but I saw I saw this guy, Josh Simmons please God, let me hope that I got that right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Josh Simmons. Josh, if you're out there, please,
please verify this story. And um, he, he explained to me, he's like, oh, yeah, man, like, I work for the skins. And I go, what do you mean? He's like, butt man, hustler, like, and I go, but in my mind, I had a, an illusion that like, a prestigious illusion that I would work for Rolling Stone or, and if it was going to be a porn mag, it would be Playboy because I read it for the articles, you know, that kind of shit. And he's like, Oh no, like filthy ass liquors. And like, <laughs> like, and I said, Oh my God. He's like, he's Dave, listen. And I learned this um, after I started doing work with tower records, I went to the tower records uh, distribution house in Sacramento once here's like, if this, if this wall behind me is the, their warehouse, this corner right here is every magazine, Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated. All of this is porn. It's like weightlifters with huge clips. It's, uh, it's, it's, and I was like, wow. So the way Josh broke it down to me at Ape was like, hey man, if you need to make, you know, in, in the time that you're trying to fucking sling your zines or whatever, like these porn magazines have literally like the lowest standards, <laughs> like they have the lowest standards and they pay exactly the same as like a major magazine. And I was like, what? So I, I would go to the newsstand, you know, this is, uh, I didn't know how to use the internet. And I would, I would uh, open up to the table of contents and like write the art director's name and get the address. And, you know, this is all before email, I would write them letters. So, oh, WT Nelson, you know, and I, and I would go home and I would, I was like, okay, I need to, uh, I need to spend uh, time drawing sexual images, you know, so I would draw I drew uh, the baby Maggie Maggie Simpson sucking Bart's dick. I drew uh, Superman fucking Lois Lane and her head exploding when he comes. And some cum droplets was hitting a pigeon. I drew midgets fucking obese people. I just drew everything. I drew like as much disgusting filth and and I sent it out to every porn magazine, um, like the you know the really really disgusting ones. And my first callback was from Buttman magazine. John Stagliano's Buttman magazine, and he would put out porno comics, erotic comics, and it was all butt fucking all the time. Just and um, I forgot the woman, the, the editor there, and she was like, "These drawings are so fucking disgusting." I, I, I grossed myself out, like I was disgusted, <laughs> and she's like, "They're so sick." And you know, I, I would talk to her on the phone about, and she's like, "She's like, man, you you got a lot of weird stories." Um, do you know anyone that writes specifically a woman? And I said, what, write what? And she's like, you know, like porno stories. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My answer was always yes. Like, yeah, yeah. And she goes, we, we pay like 200 bucks a story. And I was like, fuck, cool, yeah. So I'd send in all these dirty drawings and then I would write, you know, always <laughs> super racist, um, like Trisha Toyota is my name. And I'd write a letter to Buttman. And, and like, as I'm writing it, I'm like, oh, so all those, penthouse letters I jerked off to when I was a kid that was a guy writing it you know I was I was getting catfished that'll that'll, that'll happen later I heard about Mark Millar catfishing uh Brian Bendis with <laughs> that was wild shit man yeah you know I was listening to that and I was like I used to write letters to Dan Klaus and Adrian Tomine and all these like sad sack kind of vibe comic book artists as a hot Asian chick and I catfished them all I even I think they're uh P.O. Box two, four, seven, oh, Shattuck, something like that. I got to check, but I, I used to live in Oakland. So I would like send them all these things and I'd get like, I think Adrian told me and even printed, or I know he did. He printed one of my letters of how I was going to suck his talk for art or something. And I would catfish all these um, artists. And so uh, when I heard that Mark Millard pretended to be David Mamet, I was like, wait, so if he's doing that and I'm doing this, are any fan mail real <laughs> or is it just our other artists catfishing each other? But, um, so I wrote this long letter of this, ah, I'm Trisha Toyota. I'm new to America. I don't speak English. You know, I, I don't know why I'm doing the accent, but I would write it that way. Like really broken English and black man with a huge cock to, to rip me up. Ouch, you hurt, you know? And I'd send these letters to, to the lady there and she'd be like, this is amazing. Can I, can I meet her? <laughs> Can I talk to her? I got to meet her. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's me. And, and she fucking lost it. She went off on me. She's like, we're, we might be butt man magazine, but we print the, pr the truth. <laughs> Bullshit, bro. And I was like, wait, what are you talking about? Like, that is the most fucking fakest letter. Like, 
I come to America, I don't speak English. Like I fell on a black guy's dick. Come on, give me a break. And she goes, you will never, never work for Butt Man magazine. And I was like, <laughs> I was like oh, fuck, dude. So I, I had, now I had like a stack of like horrible porno letters and, and all this art. And I go, what do I do with this? So I go, oh, I'll just send it to Hustler. And the thing was, I used to live next door to Hustler, like on uh, in Koreatown, like the, the Hustler Larry Flint buildings right on Wilshire. So I remember just skating down Wilshire and I just like went to the front office and they're like, you got to put it in like a FedEx box or something. So I just dropped it off. And then I got this call from uh, from W.T. Nelson, Bill Nelson. And he was just like, dude, what the fuck is your what is this, dude? And I was like, I don't know, is this some shit I made up? And he's like, this is great, man. Like, can we use all of it? I'm like, fuck yeah. So they would print my art in like Asian fever and anytime I needed like a hundred bucks or something, I would write letters for them and they printed them. And uh, yeah, that was, that was the thing is I, in my mind, and I heard Mark Millar say this I, 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 in, in your guys' interview is he keeps um, talking about uh, art, uh, writers being failed artists. Like no one goes, I want to write comic books, but you know, I, I would, be obsessed with vertigo titles like uh, scalped or preacher and um i remember uh you know very similar kind of to the marvel story i remember the 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 editor for preacher axel alonso uh was doing all these uh, anthologies like weird war tales and it was all vertigo stuff and it would have frank quietly art and you know all these cool like things and i remember meeting him once at a comic con and he's like you're you're Dave Chode, like you do shit for Vice and Giant Robot and same thing, like all these jobs I would get would be because of art, you know, like Giant Robot, Eric Nakamura, I met him at Comic Con, he asked me to paint um, Yan Can Cook, the Asian chef for an illustrator, I knocked it out and he's like, damn, and I just kept drawing stuff and, you know, he became my friend and he's like, same thing, he's like, you got some fucking crazy stories, can you write that article about going to jail or being in Africa and, and then from there, Gavin McInnes, who started Vice Magazine, he would be like, dude, can you do some of that shit for us? So I'd, anything they asked for, I'd just knock out these illustrations in a day. And that's the thing is, I wasn't that good. Like, when I look at my art, I'm like, it's not that great, but they could always count on me to do it quickly. And I was, you know, I'm an on-time guy, I'm, you know? And same thing, Vice was like, do you, can you write a story about that? And I'm like, wait, I'm an artist. Why you guys keep... So Axel had re written some or read some of those articles and he goes, can you, um, can you write like an Asian gangster story for the crime anthology I got coming up? I'm like, that's easy. No problem. And, and so I go home and I write the fucking craziest, you know, it's based on my friends and people who are in jail and, and I go, yeah, and I'm going to fuck it. You know, in my mind, I think I'm Frank Miller and I'm going to draw it like in this kind of crime noir black and white. He's like, oh no, no, I don't care about your art, Dave. I just want you to write the story. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, your art's not that great. It's just, I want your writing. I was like, okay, cool, whatever. So I send this story in and then it, the, the email bounces back and I'm like, what? And then everyone's like, oh, you didn't hear? Like, uh, he works at Marvel now. And I'm like, what? What's up with all these guys hiring me and then not fucking letting me like turn my, which, which right now I'm telling you is a blessing. Like, I'm glad those things didn't happen or else other things wouldn't have happened. I think like, it worked out pretty well for you, man. Yeah, it, it, it did, so. Axel's uh, one of those guys too. He 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 frustrates me, man. He was my editor on the X Men thing, but mm -hmm. uh, he just in conversation is like, Ed, you know who my favorite artists are, man? I, I love I love Ray Pettibone and Dan Klaus. And my my thoughts are like, well, why don't we get some of that energy into these fucking comics? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean that's what I feel like. I feel I felt like uh, I had this rage in me to like, uh, like let me show you what comics can be, you know, like so. Um, I don't, I don't know where I was going with that story. It's, but, in, uh, it's interesting oh, no, no, to hear uh, you say, you know, that, that in a way you're grateful that those things don't, don't come to pass. Oh man. Um, if I don't have gratitude in my life, I'm a fucking like, every, I, I can sit here now as a 44 year old man and tell you every fucking horrible thing in my life with the right, you know, zooming out and, and perspective has, you know, and it's funny cause I suck at perspective and drawing, but like perspective in real life, I, I'm like, wow, if that, if I didn't go to jail, if I didn't do this, then this wouldn't have happened. And so um, I just remember that time turning this artwork in my, and it's like when I tell people I was in porn, 
not they go oh like you were a porn star i'm like no there's no asians in american porn <laughs> like unless you're a, a gay bottom uh I, I i mean i was in a profession of pornography where i couldn't share it with my family where i was embarrassed i couldn't really tell besides my scumbag friends and so but i was making enough money and they were sending me boxes and vi- you know those videos were expensive vhs tapes were expensive back then so people would use my house like i was the porn hub I mean, they'd come and be like, Dave, you got some uh, black on Asian or you got, and I, every room of my house, the bathroom, the kitchen had magazines, VHS tapes, and it was research material. And I remember, you know, throwing myself into my work of, um, it was the, um, the worst I had ever gotten in my life with agoraphobia because all I saw was dicks slamming into assholes day and night. And that's all butt man and hustler. They just want anal sex, anal sex. And I remember going outside and I just couldn't even look at people because I just thought people were disgusting. I remember going out once and, I, and, um, and buying groceries because I, I was like, I need to eat. And I remember at the checkout line, the girl like putting the food and I just saw dicks going into her eyes and her nose and her mouth. And I was like, ah, and I just ran out of the store and I took all the fucking porn and I put in a huge, uh, I didn't have a trash bag. So I wrapped it in a giant aluminum foil like an aluminum foil ball this big and I just threw it out my window. (laughs) Um, But that was, uh, yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a dark time. And, and um, you know, the the thing that you mentioned of Jim Lee with that portrait in in the dirty hands movie, I had just gotten out of jail. I got in, I got in trouble in Japan 15, like I don't even remember anymore, like 17 years ago. And I came back home um, um, getting out of a seven year sentence. They let me out after three months and, and I was, they suspended it. So they let, they let me go home and I had to pay rent. I owed all my friends money for my legal fees. And, you know, I had, I had a casual like uh, uh, relationship with Jim Lee. Like we weren't like homies or anything. And I just reached out to him and I said, Hey man, is there any way is, you know, I know you like my art. You told me you like my art. Is there anything? And, and he commissioned me to do that painting of his, of his family and that fucking saved my life and it was his wife at the time and his and his three daughters and i painted that thing and i was like and he and and actually the the trade i worked out with him was um some cash uh, a page an original page from the x-men you know t- era and uh and and get me a cover one day you know like i want to do a cover for for image or dc or whatever and uh and, and fuck you, Jim, you still owe me for the other two. <laughs> but um, I, I remember we, we got like, you know, I, I've had a sort of out of control life. And so I've been in a lot of mental institutions and I've been to jail. And every time I end up there, I, I mean, have you ever read Dark Knight Returns in prison? It has a completely different like, you know, like every time I'd end up in jail, there'd be that, that pot package waiting for me from Jim Lee and he'd send me like hundreds, hundreds of comics from like, not just from DC, he'd send me Marvel shit and he'd always send the classics. I remember the first like rehab I went to, there was Watchmen, Dark Knight Returns, all this shit. I go to my first mental institution there, there it is, I go to jail. He always hooks me up. And so I, I just felt, um, I just always felt like comfortable, you know, um, I, I started to feel more comfortable to be like, fuck man, I can like sit here and actually call Jim Lee my friend. Like he's my friend now. And I would be like, there's not, you know, all Asian kids my age and around my age look up to Bruce Lee because that's all we had. Like as role models, there's nothing. They go, oh, who is there? I'm like, that's it. If you're Thai, Filipino, Japanese, Korean, doesn't matter. Bruce Lee's it. Then if you talk to any fucking Asian kid in the 90s, it was Jim Lee. He was the only guy that, you know, I'm like, this guy has the number one selling comic book of all time, even till today. He's just like this, like little dude that just fucking said, fuck you to Marvel and took them all on. And, uh, and so I go, man, that guy's my friend now. I can like talk to him. I can, you know? And so I, I, I remember thinking he's my friend. If he ever finds this scene that I did, like, like I did an interview where I called him out. I did, this is before I knew him. And I go, and I don't know how many copies it's like, it's, called like the comics interpreter and maybe there were like 50 copies out there and i and i was like jim lee's like a bitch for like you know he's he's the boss he made his own company he's the writer he's the 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 artist and he makes 
the Asian guy, uh, this comic book, he did the, the divine right. He made the Asian guy like the long duck dong sidekick again. And I was like, why'd you do that? You could have told a flip, flip that narrative and made the Asian guy, the hero. And you could have, and, and, and I thought he was going to read that one day. This is my, my paranoia. I'm like, he's going to read that and not want to be friends with me. So I was like, I'll just tell on myself. I was like, Hey Jim, if you ever see this, and he's like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? <laughs> and uh, I called myself out and, and he was, he was, he was vulnerable with me. He's like, Dave, come on, man. I grew up in an all white neighborhood. I don't speak Korean. Like, you know, but to have that conversation, he's like, I'll do better. And the guy's on fire. I mean, I don't know how he does. He's got like a million kids. He runs DC. He's like Batman's boss. He's like draws comics every day. And I don't know. He's still my hero. Um, Dave, I was, I'm curious what you think of Jim Lee's art. And the reason I ask is I wonder if you guys do any art together. And I notice, uh, you know, I loved his art when I was a kid. But now mm -hmm. I find like his sketches and like he'll post this stuff that I think is just incredible. But it doesn't right. look like his comic stuff. It's where he's like using different materials and he's kind of, I don't know, taking chances, trying things. Do um, you have any thoughts on his art? Oh, I guess this is the part where I get in trouble. Um, <laughs> well, it depends how you feel about it, I suppose. Well, like, like, like I have strong opinions about many things, and then you know, the social justice warriors will come out, and the the gotcha cops will come out, and the the grammar cops. Will, you know, there's a lot of police out there, <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, he drew this line wrong," or, and I and, and and I go, "I'm not picking on Jim Lee. I think all comic book artists are pussies, all of them," and it's like. I'll go into that more. I'm a pussy. I'll stick with the I statements. I'm a pussy. I don't get pussy. I don't, I'm not, I can't make a free throw. I, I, I don't do anything well. And then finally, finally, the only time in my life where someone goes, a girl will look at me or someone will give me money or some kind of affirmation is when I can finally draw. Wow. You do, the, you do Wolverine's claws really good. So why the fuck? After never, ever getting any affirmation, any praise my whole life, you're a worthless piece of shit. And the first thing that shows that I'm a worthy human being is I could draw some snicket adamantium claws perfectly. Why would I ever change that? Why the fuck would I ever change that? And that's what I mean when I say all comic book artists are pussies. I draw, and I forget comic book artists. I know tons of artists, graffiti artists, illustrations. You find a niche. You're the guy that does this. You're the guy that does this. Why the fuck would you ever, you know, I shared a studio with James Jean for, um, I, I feel very comfortable talking shit about James Jean. I'm, I'm sure he's going to watch this. And he's inhuman. He's inhuman. Like nobody can draw like that guy. And it's not like me where I say I have to work at it. It's just flows out of him. He's a fucking child prodigy. He, he can like watch someone, he, the first time he watched me spray paint, he got can control like the first time. He was like, shh, shh, shh. I was like, fuck you. It took me 10 years <laughs> to learn that. Or he can hear someone play like a song on a keyboard and then just, he's, he's the Terminator. He's a monster. So I would, you know, we'd share this huge warehouse in downtown and I, I would go watch him paint. And the guy, it's, it's like, um, it's like I was telling you guys of like, I know how to letter. I know how to draw like Charles Burns or I know how to draw like Dan Klaus or I know how to draw like McFarlane, but I, to me, that's almost like a technique that I can teach myself and then I get bored of it. And so when I see a James Jean working on a giant like painting, like outside of comics, the first 10 minutes of that, when you see his heart and his expression, when he just does this and it looks like a Raymond Pettibone, I'm, I'm like, stop, stop. Like, do you have the guts right now to fucking um, stop right now? Or are you going to spend the next three months rendering the shit out of that and then having everyone do the likes and comments? And that's because right now that is naked James Jean. That's just stripped down and it, you can see the bones and it's like just one line and it's like a Picasso drawing. And I'm like, perfect. And now you're going to render the shit out of it. And so I know I'm jumping all over the place, but... There's, there's certain artists that have gotten like, like, like for me, the shittier Frank Miller gets and the shittier Rob Liefeld gets the better for me. Like Frank Miller's and this Frank Miller's my God. So don't take this the wrong way. I, I'll suck his dick. He's my hero. His drawings are so shitty now, like the worst. And I don't know if that's just because he's old, but I love them. I love them now more than when they were good. Rob Liefeld, like that thing that he did of just pouches, 
that's just genius. <laughs> I'm like, why does this guy just draw pouches? It's like, oh, the, his face is a pouch now. And so it, it goes back to me throwing my friend in that wrestling move against the window and, and then people running out going, it's not worth it. And I go, no one's going to get hurt. It's fucking ink on paper. You should fucking murder people on comics. You should do whatever the fuck you want. Like you should never hold back on comics. You should, it's the last place on earth where you can fuck. It's the wild west. You should be, you should not. And so when I see someone and I go, I love Jim Lee. I love Frank Miller. I love Liefeld. I love Dan Cloud. I love all these guys. I'll always, always uh, have reverence and respect for comic book artists. And at the same time, complete irreverence and go fuck yourself. You're a bunch of pussies. So as, as like James Jean's friend or Jim's friend, and I, I'm telling you guys, I'm not friends with just Asian comic book artists. I, I have, uh, but I know, do you guys remember, um, uh, and Jim's probably gonna be mad for me bringing this up. You remember when Jim, when Sin City came out and Jim Lee's style all of a sudden changed to Frank Miller style yeah, for Death Blow? Death Blow, and yeah. Everyone was do like, we, Dude, do we remember I, that? Now we're <laughs> feeling insulted. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, and, and he got in some trouble, right? People were like, what the fuck, dude? You're totally aping this guy's style. You're ripping off his steez. And and, uh, and to me, if I was Jim Lee, and I know, like, you can't fuck with this guy. His anatomy is perfect. His perspective is perfect. His details is perfect. His cross-hatching is perfect. Everything is perfect. You can't even unlearn that. His fucking muscle memory to draw, like he could probably draw a better Batman than anyone with his eyes closed, right? So now, now you want to fucking like make a mark? You want to riff? Like every anything that's scary to you, anything like, and, and you know, he's doing the 60, um, I'm not going to take credit for this, but he's doing the 60 portraits in 60 days. And so he's drawing like these crazy covers every day. And I was like, I know that fucker can paint. You know, and I, and I actually just called him the other day and I said, he did a couple like paintings that are starting to look really loose. And I said, dude, just stick to that. Do a hundred of those. And I bet you just like everything else in life, you'll become the best watercolorist, you know? And um, cause right now it looks like he's still sort of drawing with the watercolors. Um, but this isn't, this ain't just for Jim Lee. You know, I, I, this is for any artist. Like this is your heart. This is your expression. Like, you know, whenever I paint with people or draw with them, they go, oh, it's going to suck, right? And and anytime, if I were to look at your drawings from when you were four years old and your drawings when you were four and mine, they would look identical. So we all started at the same place. And at some point, whether you found sports or girls or other interests, someone, whether it's in your own family or yourself or outside said, that's not a good drawing or you suck at drawing. And it's like, I don't know. I have an appreciation for if you came to my house and you saw my art collection, it is like the most rendered technical drawings next to the most shitty, like little kid drawings. And to me, the stuff that touches me is like when you could fucking feel the nakedness, the rawness, the vulnerability. And I feel like if you're an artist that knows you've spent your entire life learning how to become a draftsman and have all these technical abilities and know where a fucking vanishing point is and, no, not to like fucking clash colors and you have all these design things and compositions, just fucking let it go. Like, just, just, just go, how can I scare the shit out of myself to, to write the most vulnerable? Like I, I did a, I did a, um, I, I felt so angry this morning that I just started drawing people beating the shit out of each other, like with a dry brush. And it just like, looked like, it's not that hard to draw people hate and anger. It's just, and, um, I just started crying. I started fucking crying while I was drawing and then I flipped them all over and same thing. People are like, I am not good at drawing noses or eyes or whatever. I'm like drawing two faces, kissing almost looks exactly like a stick figure. You just, it looks like abstract art. You just draw a squiggle and that's the two faces. And it's so easy to draw love. And I, I don't know. It's like, it's like, um, it's like when I watch those like free solo movies and people, they like climb to the summit and the top and they're like, I did it. Like there ain't shit Jim Lee hasn't done. He butt fucked the world, right? He's butt man. He got to the top of the world. He fucked everyone. He's like, I did it. I did it. I fucking am rule the universe. I tell Batman what color his underwear is. I can draw whatever the fuck I want. I, I, I you, you're there. You fucking not. Do you owe it to yourself 
Do, does it sound like I'm yelling at Jim Lee right now? No. Uh, whatever. I'm like, you owe it to like, forget the world or your fans. You owe it to yourself to go deeper into yourself, right? It's like, you've done everything outside. You've drawn the Batcave, you've drawn the universe, the, the Green Lantern's planet. Now go inward, like go deep, go hard. And I can understand why most people don't want to do that. Because why would you risk feeling those feelings again of shame of like, oh, wow, he sucks now. His drawings used to be good. And you don't want to hear that. You want to just the praise. That's, that's the, that's, that's the drug, right? That's the juice. Like, just keep telling me I'm awesome. Just keep telling me I'm good. And, and, you know, my story is different because I just keep self-destructing and people keep patting me on the back. And, and yeah, I feel like, uh, I don't know. I just, um, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm, uh, I, I, I I feel really grateful today. Uh, I can't even tell you guys how grateful I am that you guys even wanted to talk to me. Oh, it's I'm a like, pleasure, man. It's super fun, dude. <laughs> um, so yeah, Jim Lee sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Hold up. Uh, no, I, Jim, I fucking love you. You know I love you. I just always, always, that doesn't help Jim Lee. That doesn't help you. That doesn't help you, Jim. That doesn't help anyone. We all know we can draw. I know I can draw. I know Jim can draw. I know Ed can draw. And... For someone to be like, yo, got your new shit, looks dope. What does that do? Like, iron sharp sharpens iron, adamantium sharpens adamantium. Like, unless I'm critical, unless we push each other, we're not, we're never gonna get better, right? So I'm I'm critical of a guy like Jim because he I know what he did with X-Men number one, right? Unbelievable, sold eight million copies, whatever. Don't sit on your laurels. Like you we know you did that. We're not gonna forget that. Now where are you gonna take us, you know? And don't like it, it should. And the thing is, even if he chooses never to do that, right? Even if Mark Rob Liefeld's like, I'm never gonna sit down and properly learn how to draw feet, or you know, I'm still gonna love it. But it's it's as, as an artist, I'm telling you where I'm coming from. I want to go. I'm okay. Like it's like I survived my brother watching me jerk off. I survived <laughs> putting myself jerking off in a comic. So there's nothing you can do to me. There's no trolls out there. There's no one out there that can catfish me or troll me or fucking shame me like that. I haven't already done to myself. So once I'm at that level of like, you can't hurt me more than I can hurt myself. Let's go then. Let's go as deep in the comics. And, and, and why, why the fuck are we doing this shit anyways? Why are grown men sitting down with their pen nibs and fucking rulers and erasers? It's because this is, it, did, it, it, it made us feel something. It might have actually been the last time we had felt anything right? We were kids. Our parents got divorced. People were fighting outside. There was trauma and we fucking found this thing. And I, as a guy who doesn't play sports, when I hear fucking sports jock dudes talking about fantasy football, it sounds exactly like comic books. Oh, look at their new helmets. Or blah, blah, blah. I'm like, how is that any different? Silver Age, Golden Age, you know, Nolan Ryan rookie card, well, first appearance of uh, Punisher. You know, it's the same shit. It's like, those sports, those baseball cards, that nostalgia did something to you. And that watching Michael Jordan like dunk, like made you believe a man could fly in the same way, you know, you see Alex Ross, Superman, you're like, oh, that looks real, you know? Um, so, so I feel like, I feel like a responsibility. Like if you're, if you're gonna put on that hat and you know, now comics is huge, right? It's everything. Like it's all of pop culture, but if it's, it's such an important job, like even, you know, I, I walked down the street yesterday just to see the damage of the, the graffiti. And I, I, you know, I'm an anthropologist in that way. You had like a hundred thousand people pro protesting in Los Angeles. I, I'm just making these numbers up. I, I'd say 20 of those people had spray cans. So even though you saw a mob of people, the remnants of what stays up is just 20 hand styles. Right. Because when I see all the fuck cops and whatever, I'm like, that's the same guy with one. He hit every neighborhood. It wasn't a hundred different people doing that. So that's what people are going to take pictures of. That's what people are going to remember. And so if we are if we are like the watcher in the Marvel comics and, and we're just observing and then it, it is our job to like just just go there. I, I, I was talking to this uh, young artist the other day about you know, Elseworlds or, or other other dimension or what do you call it? Multiverse. 
like what what in like there's that that story i think that movie that john cusack did of what if hitler actually wasn't rejected as an artist right like what if fucking peter parker spider-man batman all these artists were actually or <laughs> superheroes were actually artists like peter parker would have the most insane photos i mean he does that already but like superman can you imagine the photos that guy would take like it's like uh um i don't know i take it you know, I, I'm all over the place. I, I get I get into weird, different modes, but I go if it's ever the end of the world and it's Armageddon, I'm the first person to, the, to get kicked off the ark. I'm like, what do, what service do I provide? Do I know how to fix a car? Do I know how to do Do I know how to cook food? I, I don't. I literally know how to do nothing except for draw comics and and make art and express myself through, you know, podcasting or whatever. And, and, and then I, you know, that's my self deprecating victim role. And then on, on my better days, I go, no, this is actually the most important job. If you're an artist, this is the, because you can lift people from such a dark place. You can, you can entertain, you can inspire, you can, it, you can do anything. You can choose whichever direction you can, you want to go, but it's, I don't, I take it as seriously, you know, and I'm sure there's a surgeon out there that's like, no, I'm actually literally saving lives, but I, I, I've had a lot of kids write me and go, if you didn't write that, if you didn't say that in that interview, if you didn't draw that thing, I, I felt like I was going to kill myself. And I've, and I felt like killing myself in my, in my life before, because I've had a lot of shit and I carry a lot of trauma around with me. And so art is that fucking thing that you stick in and you open the valve and you can like let it out. And when you do that, Oh God, do I sound like I'm fucking preaching right now? I'm going <laughs> to, can it's we talk okay, about man. Shadow Ball? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I am curious if there are any examples of cartoonists that uh, embody that sort of a more brave approach, you know, throwing caution to the wind or, or taking mm -hmm. chances in their art. Anybody that you follow or, or see books where you're like, wow, this this person's really going for it. I am a huge, huge uh, Simon Hanselman fan. Like, I don't know if you guys, I, I, I don't know something about his art style. Just I, I couldn't get into it. Like I would I see the witch and the cat and I'd be like, I don't know if that's for me. And, and yet I would still buy it. I buy every comic. I, like if you saw my house, like I'm, I get all the superhero shit. I get all the indie stuff. So I had it. I just never really dived into it. And during this pandemic, he has been drawing a comic strip a day on his Instagram. And it is the fucking, oh my God, it's so raw because he's trying to do a, a strip a day and it's just pencil and color pencil. And because the time between editing and inking and printing and, is just it's just online it is so fucking raw i can't even I, I i mean i'm sucking the guy's dick right now it's it is the best example and then ed sent me red room yesterday and uh what the fuck bro like, <laughs> give me a heads up man i'm like like uh fuck snuff film cut i'm like jesus like this is a very big departure from x-men grand design to 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 snuff film um but but even that, I'm like, wow, Ed's doing some fucking dark horror shit right now. And actually, I got to tell you, that's the first time I've ever read a comic online. I have this, like, apprehension to, like, anything. I'm like, I got to lay down and read it on a page. And I, you know, that's not going to happen right now. So I, I, I went through it. And it was a, you know, I, I fucking, I was scared last night. I was fucking scared. Big compliment. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I actually, you know, I, 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 I was, I was like... And you guys like air signed my comics for me and I spent all morning trying to find my my um, my, my Jim Rugg comics but I gave them away because uh, my house is like just comic books everywhere in the same way it used to be all porn everywhere <laughs> and anyone that co comes over and they're like wait what's this comic with this girl she's like a skater and a ninja I'm like take it so it's more of a I, I let I say it's a library but no one ever brings it back so he would he uh, would sign that Rambo 3.5 uh, Josh Josh Simmons <laughs> comic for you <laughs> You know who used to do that is uh, Stan Lee. Um, I, I used to work at a comic book store in Beverly Hills and when I was 18 years old and Stan Lee was coming in to do a signing. And I remember all the fucking kids in line, DuckTales, Batman. And, like, <laughs> and I'm like, hey, uh, you know, this is the day after everything was over. I was like, hey, Stan, like, you didn't, you didn't make Batman. He's like, did you see that kid's face? And I was like, yeah, I was fucking stoked. And he's like, he doesn't give a shit. Why should I give a shit? And I was like, 
<laughs> I was like, whoa. And uh, he was just like, he was like a, he was like a ham. He was like, he was like, never correct yourself, you know? And so I took that energy with me. I'd go to like countries and people would be like, ha, ah, Jackie Chan. I'm like, yeah, I'm Jackie Chan. And <laughs> I'm like, for me to sit down and go, Jackie Chan's from Hong Kong, which is not Chinese, and I'm from Korea. They don't give a shit. They think they see Jackie Chan. I'm Jackie Chan. So I learned how to be a, a, a ham from Stanley. <laughs> Dave, in our uh, previous conversation, um, one of the things you brought up uh, that you suggested we cover was that Kevin Eastman Tundra interview from uh, mm -hmm. Comics Journal. And then I was like, oh, yeah, dude, we're, we're, we're on it, man. We, we got a video uh, for that thing. And then you described how that was like a little bit of a template for when you, you had massive success to sort of like know what to do, what not to do, how to navigate in a room full of vultures, as they say. Uh, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I mean, uh, my therapist calls it deprivation. Like I'm doing this interview right now from my friend's house because I still live in the same house I've lived in for 20 years as uh, it's, it's my own work I need to do on whether I feel like... I, like the fact that I can, um, like I have enough money now to literally do whatever I want. It's like, it just seems like a lot of work, you know, to buy a Bentley and to buy a mansion and get a pool guy. And it's like, why don't I just like, that's not where I find joy, you know? And, and, and I remember reading that comics journal thing. And once again, going full circle to looking at, and the thing is, my first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic wasn't Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It was Donatello number one. Great and, issue. We have I a mean, video about that one as well, man. I'll send it your way. Fuck out of here. See, you guys, <laughs> you guys are in my, like, please. I know other guys have told you this. Do this show forever. Do it for fucking ever, man. I'm telling um, you, in, in, in some small way, like, you were always in the back of my mind whenever we started this thing. Because the headspace Jim and I share, it is, it's indie and it's, a certain element of like the mainstream and shit and those are i've know, never are in my i mean besides my close friends that are into comics i've never seen this where we can like switch from rob liefeld to robert crumb like that's my shit like just comics no judging no lines it's all same thing with film or any anything in pop culture i i like all the jim jarmusch shit i like all the marvel shit it doesn't matter i, I like I like it all so you know seeing that that um Donatello, you know, like it was so simple. He was on the cover and he had the fucking bow staff. And that issue was, um, there was like a gem, right? And, and the guy, the artist, if he tied the gem, anything he drew would come to life. And I remember the, the, it was like a black guy named Kirby. After I didn't know who Jack Kirby was at the time. And so um, it just blew me away. Like I was, you know, it's the fucking eighties, nineties. I'm like, he's a turtle and he's a ninja. Like get the fuck out of here, you know? And, and so, and they just had the, it's like, uh, like you guys with your show and, and the, the, the synergy and the symmetry of your energies. Like, I, I don't know the exact breakdowns of what Peter Laird drew or whatever, but I just knew it just hit me, you know, and it felt different than my GI Joe, you know, Herb Trimp, Mike Zek stuff. And, and, and I found out later that Todd McFarlane did some Jim, uh, GI Joes also. Um, Issue number 60. We, we, we have a video on I, that as well. No, I asked this fucking guy, Jim, I asked Jim, actually, I'm going to ask you. I get so fucking scared listening to your show because I'm like, either they have their phones up and they're Googling everything, or this guy, the response time is so quick that he must have a photographic memory. Yeah, he, he does. Right? He, 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 he's a good resource, for sure. I've never met anyone in my life that has that much useless information in their head. <laughs> and then you're the second guy that has that much. I mean, the shit you guys say of like, Oh, what book was he on? Oh, well, his wife from 1970, she just got like uh, cancer. So he must have, that must have affected. And then those brushes weren't made by that. I'm like, where the fuck are they getting this information? And you guys are, anyways, I'll, I'll suck both your dicks all day, all day, all night. But um, I, 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 that story was such an inspiration, right? Like we don't work for Marvel. We don't work for DC. We, we do our own thing. And what was it from? Us just being goofs and fucking around what is the most ridiculous drawing we could ever draw turtles that are teenagers and they're mutants and they're ninjas and we stole it all from daredevil like and and, and then it's on the wall and as a little kid i'm like i got three quarters for gigantic but that's fucking four hundred dollars like and then oh shit here he's on a simon bisley cover on the comics journal and it's this thick fucking thing that goes into yeah i hired my dad i hired my brother i hired my sister and then this guy made you know 
took advantage of me and and you know I, I'm I'm a kid reading this or I don't know how old when I was when it came out but I was like this is one of the most entertaining interviews and and I'm always taking this information and people I always look at myself as a, an artist or a writer and yet people are like you're a great businessman and that's because my mom is like a ruthless businesswoman and I just grew up around that and um, I remember you know I've made a million dollars several times in my life doing different things through art through facebook through gambling and i remember always i remember like i don't care about money i don't like i've never cared about money i've always cared about um and 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 you know once again to tie it back in it's because we lost everything in the la riots like i went to on welfare with my family for a year and then my mom i saw her hustle and start selling herbalife uh vitamins and we became rich and then she lost it all during like the, you know the asian market collapse or something so i i i have that trauma that ptsd of, of nothing lasts forever money especially is fleeting so what is it right now if we want to get present right now in this moment not tomorrow not what happened in the past or in the future it's like what can we do and so i try to stay present and focused and um and 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 so i i very little of how I've lived my life has been motivated by money. And then as I get older, it's, it was a very immature, naive way, like, fuck money, I'm the hobo, I'll hitchhike. You know, that was my, I, I, I like that romantic vision. I was like, I'm gonna be like the homeless romantic. I'm gonna just hop trains, I'm gonna be a hobo, I'm gonna do graffiti, I'll do zines, I'll be like Aaron Comet Bus. Like that was, that was my, you know, I, 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 you know, in art school, there was nine of us living in a three bedroom apartment. And, um, and then I just, as I get older and you start to hear about, um, how money affects, you know, society and how the injustice. And I said, in, in my super typical cocky way, the same way I thought I was going to be like the next Garth Ennis or Frank Miller. I was like, I'm pretty sure I, I know how to make, like, if I wanted to, like, I would know how to make money. And, um, and I, I that was just, it was just like, I don't care about it. But if I did care about it, I bet you. And so I said, what if I just try to be a millionaire in five years? Like, what if I, I don't give a shit about any? And I go just as a personal test, a challenge to myself to see if I can do it in the same way. Like I would sit down and go, can I draw exactly like Todd McFarlane or Charles Burns or any of these guys? If I, you know, it was like a, you know, it's like a personal challenge. And I did it. I became a millionaire before I was 30. And I was like, I. I'm, I'm, I'm outwardly verbalizing my internal thoughts. So sorry if I'm coming off super braggadocious and, and cocky, but I just, these, these are the, you know, I'm like, I think I can do it. And then I did it and people go, Oh, well, you, you must've been lucky. And I go, but, but then I did it again in a different field. And then I did it again. And, and then I start to look at what are the things that um, are in common. And it's like the fearlessness, just going for it, like not being scared, especially I get being scared if someone's pointing a gun to your face, but don't be scared when it comes to fucking ink on paper. Don't be scared when it comes to pushing pigment on oil. It's like, it's fucking, oh, he's a dangerous outlaw artist. I'm like, it's fucking, you can white it out, right? Everyone's like, oh, it's going to suck. It's like, it's fucking art. There's erasers. There's buff paint. You can always, and so, so I, I feel like to to come from nothing and then all of a sudden be, like Rich, you know, that fucking Eastman interview was like, shit, man, there's so many, I should just study this because I'm, I'm, I'm reading that. I'm like, he's like in his 20s and he's like, I'm rich. I want to do a fucking, you know, Bill Sinkovich book. I want to do, a, you know, like, oh, you want money? Hey, you get a book. You get a book. You, that's exactly what. And, and I told you, I've made a lot of those similar mistakes. And, uh, and, and the lesson of no good deed goes unpunished comes to me like comic comic book artists are the fucking strain they're different than any other I, I won't even say different than any other artists they're just different than any other human beings on the planet like they're not like i've met artists that they've had insane money offers for fame for prestige for whatever and they're like no i'm just gonna keep drawing this ninja with on a horse with a with like a his friend a sloth and i'm like they found their thing and they're going to stick to it. And there's not like same thing with uh, comic book art collectors, right? Like there will be a guy that 
will have a, like a rare piece of art and someone will offer them tons of money. And they're like, no, I want it. There's no, like, so I, um, I, I remember like that was a, that was a fucking priceless issue for me. Cause there was so many lessons there. I was, the second I made money, I was like, I'm going to hook up every fucking one of my friends. I'm going to fucking give everyone every dream, you know, and I learned very quickly, like I'm sitting there like in an Eastman scenario of like all my friends like hating me because I bought them a music studio or because I'm like, wait, but I, I love you. I, I wanted to help you make your movie or your album. And it's like, fuck you, dude, for helping me. And I'm like, wait, wait. Uh, you know, it's like they, they start resenting you when you start picking up the bill for dinner every time. And and um, it, like these things that I would have never known, you know, there's no handbook on it, except there is this Eastman <laughs> interview. So. <laughs> I was like, okay, make sure to not hire my brother for anything. Make sure to not, you know, so I, it really, you know, there's all these things, right? More money, more problems with great, you know, money is power with great power comes great response. There's all these, these things and they're all true. Like I've had problems today that I, that I've never had. And I've been in a room with billionaires complaining about the price of, uh, of how much it costs to gas up their yacht. And I'm like, you should never have this conversation out loud anywhere, <laughs> you know, but to that person, it is a problem. Right. And so it is, uh, it is, um, it is a great, it's a, there's an art to giving away money. Right. And I think, you know, I don't know how old Eastman's now is in his fifties or sixties, but I'm sure he sounds like more mature now and he's learned and, and, uh, but yeah, it sounds like, he sounds like exactly what I would have done if I was his age. And in that situation, I'd be like, um, you know, I, I'll tell you guys, I don't think Frank would mind. Like I, I, I worship Frank quietly. Like he's one of my favorite artists. He, I know he lives in, in like in Glasgow and um, I, I'm like, I just, I, I love everything he does. Like he's, he's to me like the guy, maybe because it's the writers he works with, but it's like, he's the superhero guy that, you know, that just, it, it, it doesn't feel like typical superhero shit. And I would just love to do something with him, but you know, I'm, so I, I get his, I get his number through Jim Lee and I call him and he's just, he's a busy guy. Anyone who's a successful comic book artist is busy. They're like, I'll pencil you in in 2030, you know? And so I said, uh, I said, dude, you're fucking, you know, he doesn't know me from the next guy. He's like, you're, you're one of Jim Lee's friends that's calling me. And I said, I get that you're busy. I know that you're working with like the best writers in the business. Um, I'm guessing that you have sketchbooks. I'm guessing that you have uh, illustrations that have been rejected. He's like, yeah, I got all that shit. I would never show that to anyone. I'm like, can you show it to me? He's like, yeah, sure. So I send him, uh, I send him, um, uh, or he sends me like photos of, of sketches and shit. And these are like, these are all rejects. And I, I, leave, I print them all out and I put them on my desk and I just stare at them for the whole day. Cause it's like the human mind, right? That's, you can take a picture of like a porno illustration, an apple, like a violin and just three, you know, and the, the brain, we, we like stories, we like narratives. So we will write a story, we will connect that. And I don't know if that's how Stanley and, and Jack Kirby worked, but you know, I've always, been big on reverse engineering and doing things the wrong way and going through the back door and not, Hey Dave, that's not really how you break into comics. That's not really how I go. Okay. Go fuck yourself. I, I write on walls. Okay. <laughs> like, um, so he sends me this stuff. I take a day to process it. And then I wrote this short story from his sketches and then I sent it to him and he's like, I fucking love this man. Like, let's keep doing this. And, and, uh, and you know, I, I why am I telling the story? To, to show off that I know Frank quietly. Um, no, I've never met him before. I mean, this, this is all happening during this pandemic, but like for me, I don't like, if you have enough passion and you have enough energy, it's like you can make these, these amazing things happen, you know? And in, in my, in my experience, and then from reading the Kevin Eastman interview, very rarely does just throwing money at things, you know, like you remember when Netflix, everyone was getting $20 million, like Chappelle got 20 million. It's like, let's say you give them a hundred million dollars. Like things need time to like turn into something. You can't just throw money at it and be like, 
just because I gave Frank Miller a million dollars, like he needs like 10 years to make, you can't just keep giving money to people. So um, I learned, I'm learning. I'm still, I still am learning. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't, I forgot if I told you this, Ed, but I just, I stopped selling my art in uh, 2009 because uh, I use this example always. Like if, if Jay-Z's like selling like mixtapes out of the back of his car when he's like an up and comer, it's like 10 bucks, right? And then Jay-Z becomes a billionaire. His music's still 10 bucks. There's no elitism. It's not like you have to pay, well, actually Wu-Tang, you have to pay a million dollars to listen to their, their new one. But aside from the, the Wu-Tang, like same thing with comics. If I had gone the route of comic books, comic books cost the same to everyone. But as my star has risen in the fine art world, you know, it's priced out 99% of my fan base, you know, like I was like, Oh, I'll go to prints now. My prints sell for thousands of dollars. And I go like, and then like the people that do buy my art for that much money, like if I make shit cheap, then they're going to be mad at me. So I'm in this like weird thing. And I go, I'm like, I didn't know the course of my life, what it was going to take where I would get to, but I didn't become an artist to make, you know, these pretty things to, to match the decor of your mansion, you know, like, so I just felt sick. I had, um, you know, I felt blessed. I had my last show in 2009 on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. I sold, you know, millions of dollars worth of art. And that, that, you know, like, I know, I know it all. Like I've walked through the fine art world, the gallery institutions, the museums, the fucking comic cons. Like it just, I know that world. Like I know like fine art, that shit is like insider trading. That is, you got to play games. Like, you know, I, I know how to do that. And I just, I was like, I just, I'm an artist, man. I fucking don't want to think about, oh shit, I just p- made this painting. Now it's going to go on auction at Sotheby's. Uh, like, so I think that's what's been pushing me back towards doing comics. And also, um, I have enough, you know, I have enough, it's like a fucking super blessed place to be in because I, I have my art in like, some of the biggest art collections. I have like the most richest dudes in the world own my art. So I know that if I need to like fund my next project, I could just sell a painting, but I'm already rich. So I don't need to sell it. So everything I do now is for the kids. You know, Wu-Tang is for the children, you know, same thing. Like all, all I do now is mural, just things that people can get for free, you know? And I try to do that in a way that people can't, you know, I know people still do, like they'll get whatever I did and try to sell it on eBay. I mean, I, I, I shit my pants when I saw slow jams on eBay for whatever. I was like, oh, it's up to a hundred bucks or something. And then I, I saw one sell for like a thousand or something. I'm like, damn, fuck you, Eastman and Laird. I fucked you guys up. You know, <laughs> I couldn't give those fucking things away. I couldn't give them away. And now it's like, shit. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a fucking shit disturber. I, I, like, I like graffiti. I like people. You want to fucking, oh, I can't get a copy of a thousand dollar copy of Slow Jams. Like, fuck, just have someone Xerox it and send it, you know, like I'm, that video game, I'm, I know I'm talking from a very privileged position and I'm grateful for, for that. But if I treated money like a video game, which I did, I won that game. So for me to continue to keep playing after I've won World of Warcraft or got to the, like the kill screen on the Donkey Kong is like, it's just me jerking off. It's like for me to spend another day to be like, how can I make another million dollars is it's, it's sick. So I go, what can I do now to, to help? And I go, well, in all my adventures and travels and all the interests I have, it's just comics always at the end of the day is that's the thing like where, I mean, I can't even tell you guys how much I cry when I read comics now. Like when I, like I cry all the time, like I'll just, like this is how I read comics. I'll, 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 I'll like read and then I'll pause and then I'll, I'll put it on my chest and then I'll, <laughs> all right. And then I'll get back to it. And it's just like, it's like my, it's my, it's my space. I can control how fast I want to read it, go back to it, study the art. And so, um, you know, it's, you know, as a storyteller, as an artist, as an entertainer and, and all these things, I always try to be like, I've been blessed. What have I learned in this life? And what is the best vehicle to give that back to the world, to inspire, to entertain, whatever those things are. So, and, and for me, it's you guys, <laughs> for me, you guys fucking kill me, man. Like you're literally killing this shit. Like 
I tell fucking everybody about you guys because I mean the people that I know that would care about it. Um, is it a challenge, David, figuring out what you want to do um, in terms of having too many choices? Like, like for instance, when I was in college, uh, Photoshop was just starting, and I had a design teacher that would caution us, like, because he would see us just rifle through every font choice, you know, and, and staring at the screen, and it was this infinite choices in front of us. And I mean, we're in that position now where, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to make, like, I mean, you've done video, you know, prints, paintings, performance, installation, all these different things, like, is that a, is that an issue for you, like figuring out like? Absolutely, I, I'm I'm an addict. I have no self control. I'm bipolar. I have fucking serious mental issues that I've had to be hospitalized for. So, um, so <coughs> once again, the, the perspective of older age and and zooming out. If I if you guys sat there right now and looked at your lives as far as your creative um, output and and like what's your best work. Like for me, I love buying art from um, artists who are just newly divorced because they just lost half and then they're like angry and they're sad. So they're putting out this like their best work and and it's usually cheaper. I'm st come on. I'm still Korean. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it's it's that's a fucking great question because um, uh, shit, that's a great question that I just forgot. Sorry. Um, just how you make choices as to, you know, what right, you right. want to do if you can do just about anything right so when i look look back and i go okay i'm 44 years old what is the most productive not just productive but like quality and it's always in a restrictive nature right it's always um jail i drew more than i've ever drawn in my life in jail more than i in China, I lived in a rural area of China where there was no internet, there was no cell phone service. I was on fucking fire. I did an art show in Beijing and it was like, for me, still like one of the best shows I've ever done. Uh, Africa, obviously the the pygmy tribes I'm in that don't have Wi-Fi or anything. And I just, it's an explosion. So I know for myself, anytime I put myself, and then this is a dangerous part because I've prescribed or subscribed to the notion that you have to suffer Right. And some people would still accuse me of doing that. Like, hey, you're a multimillionaire. Why don't you have air conditioning? Why don't you have Wi-Fi at your house? Why don't you? And I go for me to be at this point, like I don't have Instagram. Like I, I have an account, but I don't run it. I don't touch it. I can't be on there because it's I can't handle it. And that's just as, as someone who's like has addict nature. I can't handle those things. I And so to restrict myself, it, it's definitely it's very very hard it's very frustrating to wake up and be like i can eat at any restaurant i can do anything and uh and 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 you know i got called out from a friend uh, who you know i told everyone i was like look at every fucking comedian look at eddie murphy when he was young and hungry he's fucking delirious raw look at him now rich guy doing donkey shrek shit like like anytime you get if fat and rich, you're fucking boring, you're nothing. So you got to stay in the zone. You got to stay in the fucking zone. And the way you do that is you got to stay fucking humble and poor. And you got to fucking, and, and, and wow, Dave, for someone who's really challenged like every fucking aspect of his life, you really, that's, you're playing that old song. Like, have you even tried to make art from a place of joy and happiness? I'm like, no, because that doesn't work. And it's bullshit. You can make great art, but it's not going to be the best fucking art that transcends. And they're like, why don't you even give it a shot? And, and the thing is today, I'll tell you guys, I've done a lot of work on myself. I, it's the hardest shit I've ever done. And I've spent years doing it. And it's, I, I, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. It's still, I, I am a very sensitive artist. I've developed a very thick skin. And to wake up every morning and have all like portals open, all holes open, everything, I can do anything I want. And, and as someone who can't stay focused and who likes to procrastinate, um, you guys see the J.D. Salinger documentary? No. Like, he, he, you know, spoiler alert, he put out Catcher in the Rye, becomes this cultural phenomenon, and then just goes into this compound and then just writes for the rest of his life, but never puts it out. And, and that effect, not that I'm J.D. Salinger, but I've had great success in my life. I've had these crazy things happen to me. And... I just we, we live in a weird place where people are really hurtful with their words and, and you know, there's all these trolls and I go, I, I, I painted whatever the fuck I want when I had nothing. 
right? Because I had nothing to lose. And I'm like, I'm going to paint right. In the, and then it would feel weird to me. Like, wait, I have all the money in the world now. Why would I paint to like fit someone else's expectation of me or get a boss or something? So it, I got to tell you, it's a fucking unbelievable, liberating feeling. Like today, like I took this interview very seriously. I, the thing that I'm sort of beating myself up is I have visual like I could show you like my X-Men sketches and all these comic books, but anyways, um, I take every single thing I do seriously. And the thing is I never stopped. It's like, okay, wait, where, where he didn't put a new book out or he didn't, you know, where's his podcast. I have hundreds, if not thousands of hours of me talking into a microphone by myself. Like, it's just, it, it's, there's no, it's, it's, it's insanity. I'm like sitting in a room, at least you guys have each other. Like I'm in a room talking by myself, crying, laughing, making like, like, it's just, and I'm not there to judge it. Right. It's like, is that performance art? Is that dog shit? Or is that true? Are you an unreliable narrative? I don't fucking know. I'm not putting any restriction on myself. I'm just doing it, whether it comes out when I die or like if I have enough guts to put it out while I'm alive. Cause as, as, you know, as I say to you guys, as a comic book artist, you can fucking do anything. You can do fucking anything. And just there isn't enough people that care to to come at you. But I, I when I made the transition from comics to, to to podcasting and I treated broadcasting the same way as comics, I'm still feeling the effect. I mean, people came out of the woodwork be like this motherfucker. This, and I go, hey, man, I'm I'm an unreliable, unreliable narrator. Don't trust everything I say. I, I like to make myself laugh. I like to, you know, it's like masturbation with words, you know? And, um, so I have thousands of drawings. No one's ever seen. I've had thousands of oil paintings, spray paintings, mixed media, movies, TV shows. Like I never stopped. And, and, and I get in the mode, like right now I'm in the comics mode. So I have, I drew Wolverine. I sent you one. Um, I keep drawing Wolverine with like a huge foreskin because I like the story that he can't be circumcised because it keeps growing back. But <laughs> like, that's what you do when you're rich. You draw Wolverine naked with the, you know, uncut, you know, sneak it. And, uh, and so I, yeah, I, it is a challenge. And so I need to put like self-imposed restrictions on myself so that I, if, if I had Instagram, if, you know, if any of the great invent, like Michelangelo or Leonardo um, Donatello, I just named all the turtles. Uh, <laughs> if any of those great artists had Instagram or, or Pornhub or any of these things, they, they would have never done anything. So I know that about myself. So I stay in a, in a restricted depth, you know, and I don't know how healthy that is. It's not healthy, but I stay in like sort of a self-imposed deprivation thing. And that's why this pandemic right now, I've seen a huge explosion for uh, artists because this is jail. This is jail. This is jail time. Everyone's like, time's moving sort of weird right now, not fast. And so I'm like, this is you with all your homies in the prison cell being like, when are you getting out? Three months? When are you getting out? Oh, I got a lifetime sentence. No one knows how this shit's going to end. The riots, we're doing a fucking interview right now during a riot outside, like about comic books. Oh, I got the Xerox rant and I show you how to move it on the on the Xerox machine to get a blurry. It's like, what the fuck, dude? What planet? How tone deaf are you? There's a And I go... We don't know when, when that shit's gonna end, and and, and I use the line uh, Mark Ruffalo's line for uh, for um, from Avengers, like, "Hey, don't you gotta get angry to turn into the Hulk?" Like, I'm, my secret is I'm always angry. I don't need a riot. I can tap into that shit from '92, from fucking the Gaza Strip. I'm always angry. I can always remember like people yelling racist shit at me or whatever. I can tap right into it. I don't have to just keep putting myself in and suicide bombing myself and my career and my my everything. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I have been more prolific in my positive mental state and, you know, of being grateful and, and, you know, people, you know, people say to me that like, damn, Dave, like I watch Seinfeld, I watch Curb Your Enthusiasm. I've never met anyone who complains more than you. And I go, yeah, I'm grateful. I'm happy to have all the things and the opportunities and all these things, but like, yeah, I'm a fucking old whiny Jew. Like that's, that's my, at my soul, I grew up around all Jewish people. That's my nature. That's how I interpret stuff. And, and I, and I realized like, um, like I, I'm like a really, really negative person. Like I think really, really bad shit about myself. And, you know, this is very typical of most artists finish the page. You look at it, you hold it up and you go, fuck, that sucks. This is, this is, this is, this is not good. And, uh, you know, 
And I go, how can I flip the script on that? Like, oh, well, it sounds too like braggy or it sounds like too full of yourself. How, how do I end this page and go, fuck, man, that's the dopest fucking page I've ever done in my life. Like, well, I don't believe that. I, I don't think that. And I go, there's a, there's a saying that they go, fake it till you make it. And go, just try that on. Because, I you know, I've done a lot of therapy and they go, you from morning to the time you go to sleep, say more negative things about yourself, like thousands. You're fat, you're ugly, nobody likes you, you are a fucking piece of shit, your art does suck, no, you know. Like, I don't need someone else to say it, I'm already saying that. And so to get to a place of gratitude and say, you know what, Dave, you tried your best today, you're not Todd McFarlane, you're not Frank Miller, you're not even Jim Rugg or Ed Pisker, but it's pretty good, pretty damn good. I'm gonna give yourself a pat on the back and, and, and then, wow, like ending on like some kind of positivity feels sort of good. And then it, it builds and it builds. And so I've never done that before. I like, so, sorry, sorry if I sound like a newbie in, in all those things, but I I'm just, I'm more used to being ain't Like I said, like those were my two emotions, anger and hate. And like black is the new black. Like that was it. Like a dark heart, dark arts, blackness, shadows, heaviness, and just, I don't know, like anything else feels too scary, like to, to feel love and to feel light. And, uh, and so, um, to, to stay grateful for the things I have and to appreciate them and to, to, to be positive about myself. Like, you know, like everything good that's ever happened to me, I go immediately to, you don't deserve that. You're, 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 you're who are you? Who the fuck are you to get? You're nobody. You got lucky. You got this. And I go, how has that served me except keeping me down? Like I'm my, I'm, I'm in a, like I tell everyone I got out of the last time I was in jail was 15 years ago, but I'm like, I never left. I'm still there. I'm still in a fucking mental prison. That's like worse than like the actual adamantium bars that were holding me in, you know? Um, so once again, sorry, going riffing off. <laughs> I, I described a, a little bit of that to, to Jim once. Uh, I sort of revealed to him that uh, every time I have a new book come out, I, yeah. I stay in bed for a month and I don't know why. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't do anything. I can't function. And, and Jimmy was like, oh, that's called imposter syndrome. And it's super common. And, you know, here's, here's, you know, this guy talked about it, that, that lady talked about it. They're super successful and they feel it too. And just by having a fucking word to associate with that feeling was mm -hmm. so helpful to me, man. That's, can I ask you guys a question about, um, like, like I love your, both your guys' art and your and your and your work. When you got to a point where, where, where you could say to your parents and your friends and your family, like, "Look, here's my shit in print. Like I'm making like this is like I'm a professional now. Like I'm actually making a living drawing shit out of my head and selling it to people." Were you able to sit in that, or it's just like, "Oh, I got to make my next deadline." Like, how long did that feeling last? Of like, "Fuck," like. It, uh, there was never a euphoria. Like, I, I, I feel like, and Jim, Jimmy, tell me if I'm wrong, man, but I think one of the running themes is uh, that, what's the word? It's always a letdown or always anticlimactic. Anti That's it. It's always anticlimactic. You do the shit, you have the accomplishment, you expect uh, some sort of, you know, like this will cure all of my uh, sadness or, or this will make me extremely happy or fulfill me. And then you get the book or have the art show or something and it's like you know that was okay go back home you might be wired for the night not be able to sleep at your usual bedtime or some shit but the next day you got to put on your britches make some shit you know it's because the good the good times at the drawing table it's the 200 pages that go into the book and then it's one day that the book's released that's true you know during, it's it's, it's two years of that adventure. so the journey is the adventure yeah it really is it's meditative and, and also like I remember putting slow jams out and then getting a trickle of fan mail and hate mail over the course of the next two years, right? It'd be like one person writing a letter, licking the stamp. Now it's like you just post the drawing and like immediately like dope, shitty, arm looks weird. What's up with that guy's head? You know, and it's all out there. And um, I, I feel like um, that's a great word, anticlimactic. You remember the, the crossovers and the buildup in the, in the superhero books? It's like, the biggest event of the summer and then we're going to reveal Wolverine's origin finally or you know I'm sitting here and as you said the word anticlimactic talking about the creative side I'm like all the stories were anticlimactic 
Like, I, like whatever the thing was, like, we're going to find out who, what Wolverine's true origin is. And, and I still don't even fucking really know what it is <laughs> or is his name, this or that, or we're, you know, you remember the big one with, um, uh, there was Superman versus Muhammad Ali. And then there was Marvel versus DC who would win in a fight, Captain America or Batman or Hulk or, you know, Superman. It was all anticlimactic. Yeah, all you, of it. you just need to read one of those to realize that neither, you know, billion dollar company is going to let their, their character look like a bitch. So yeah. it's meaningless. Right. And so I, 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 I you know, I, I want, I wanted to get your guys perspective on it because people go, what, what is that like to get a phone call and say, Hey, you know, you're worth millions of dollars. And I go anticlimactic. It's like, <laughs> it's like, and I'm not saying that in a, in a, you know, way that I don't appreciate it. It's just, I've met the most successful, the richest, the most powerful, the most talented people on earth. And they all have that in common anticlimactic. It's like, I killed myself. I, I neglected my family, my health, everything for this passion, this one fucking thing to get to here. And the next day it's like, you know, you hear about Michael Jordan, like winning like the NBA finals and then just going to practice the next day. It's like, like they can't, I shouldn't say they, I can't even sit in it for, it's like, Oh, cool. I sold this many books. Oh, that girl that I never thought I could get, I just got her. And, uh, and then it's like the next morning you wake up and I go back to the drawing board. So I, I knew to, to avoid becoming a VH1 behind the music story. It's like, I, I can't, like, this is a narrative that I, I find in all these successful creative people. And it's like, um, I, I can't keep playing this story out over and over. Like I have to find some, like how many, like, you know how many rich people I know that live in mansions that have never like really like stayed there long enough to use the pool and enjoy like, it's like, they just, it's like this, uh, it's, you know, and I, I, that's why I spend so much time in Africa. Just, you know, I, I stay with this hunter gatherer tribe. That's like just completely different than my way of thinking. And, and there I'm a fucking poor person, right? Like there, I don't know how to hunt. I mean, they fucking clown on me. They're like, this motherfucker looks like he's never sh caught shit in his life. And I'm like, I haven't. So the guy that knows ha has the best bow skills, the best hunting skills, he's the billionaire. Right. I'm the fucking dude that's like, oh, can I can I get can I eat the squirrel's nuts? Can I get you know? <laughs> so I, I, I need I need to constantly ground myself and center myself because to 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 keep finding new apples to reach for and then oh I got it. Oh, it tastes like the last one. Oh, it's like what's the next thing and the next thing and, and the, you meet them and it's like you remember the 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 commercial was be like I wanna be like Mike and then you want to be like Mike only when he's dunking and only when he's winning. You don't want to be him 99%. Like the guy looks fucking miserable. That like, net, that Netflix documentary sort of reveals, reveals that energy, you know, corroborates what you and said. And he's the greatest example of that in the sports world. But like, I'm just talking about in general, like how many people can you say like, Oh fuck, I would trade my life for that person's or I, I want, I want what that person has. And it's like, I can get there right now, whether I have money or no money, I can get there, whether I have, a top selling book or not. It's like, as long as I can sit here and be like, man, I fucking like, like I, I love that I'm talking to you guys and I, I'm sorry if I, I'm sucking your guys dicks too hard and, and you're getting feeling raw, but <laughs> I, I can't even begin to tell you how much I appreciate you guys. I know I've said it, but I gotta, like, I appreciate that. Like you guys exist. Like it just, it did something to me. Like I was like, fuck. And, and, and more than anything, when I called you, Ed, like, you know, I, I just, I wasn't looking for an interview. I wasn't looking to, to do this. I just was like, I need to tell you guys how much I appreciate you. Whether you guys feel that or not, you're fucking definitely doing uh, God's work or um, I don't know, what's a good Marvel God that I can do an Odin <laughs> for? Um, and, um, and I hope you, I hope you understand or at least feel, forget understanding, I hope you feel that what you're providing is like, you know, oh, we're making great content. You're, pr you're providing like such joy to so many people. Like I, I feel like I have a good day after I listen to a, a kayfabe interview. I'm like, fuck man. And then like, you know, my, my people around me that don't care about comics, they're like, turn that shit off. What is that? What the fuck, those, man? Those fucking stuttering uh, douchebags. <laughs> <laughs> you need to cut those people out of your life. David. <laughs> 
they're gone. But yeah, I, I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. You know. You know what, man? What one more piece to just kind of go along with what we were talking about? Uh, well, well. How uncomfortable was that for me to tell you how much I love you guys? A little bit. A little bit. We. Uh, it was a New Year's resolution to accept more compliments and not be like, well, what about this bad thing or that bad thing? So uh, thank you for the compliment. You know, we keep shit rocking. But <laughs> uh, but um. Two real great examples of what you were just talking about, David. There was a video floating around uh, with somebody kind of, uh, you know, a TMZ type person. They uh, saw Jerry Seinfeld uh, in New York or something. He was on a, on a bike and he was strapping it up about to go do something. And the guy behind the camera is like, Jerry, what are you talking about? You, you, what are you doing? And, and uh, Jerry's like, well, I'm about to go to work. Like, I, I guess he was biking to a comedy club or something. And they were like, what are you talking about? Like, like uh, you don't have to do anything. And, and Seinfeld's like... What are you talking? About? Like I'm still a a person, right, you know. Yeah. I'm still a human being. I still have to do things. And then uh, I think it was Guy Ritchie was either on uh, Joe Rogan or he was on the Nerdist podcast with uh, Chris Hardwick, and he just said this very simple thing that also like really resonated with me and those feelings of that imposter syndrome that we were talking about. Uh, he just said, "You only have to hold the trophy to realize that it's hollow." And then that's when I'm like, okay, well, I'll just have to be satisfied that I won't be satisfied. You know what I'm saying? I'm just going to, I got to keep doing the same stuff. I don't know what else to do with my time. And then just know, notice the pattern, you know, notice the pattern that it's going to be whatever, especially like in our, in our space where when the book comes out a year after you put pencil to paper, that's your past. Yeah. You're a different person at that point. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a journey from like, like the, the, talking with your friends, hey, what about this idea? And then this this craziness. And and I don't know what that's like. I've never done a horror comic, but I don't know what it's like for you to, and specifically to stay in that mental space to be torturing people, like in a, in a torture chamber. And then like you're at dinner and you're like, yeah, I just drew someone getting their nips fucking ripped off and then choked <laughs> by their own in inwards. It's like, uh, hey, hey, what do you want to have for dinner tonight? It's like, uh, it's bred from this quarantine, man. I've been in this house for 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 months by myself. The only person I see is Jim, uh, yeah. and, and that is uh, certainly reflected on the uh, the page and to some extent, I would say. One of my highlights in my life was um, going on the Howard Stern show like three, four years ago. I don't even remember Loved when that it. was. It, it was a while back, man. It was about yeah. eight, eight years ago. I I re-listened to it last night in prep for this. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think they even like replayed it but they edited a bunch of stuff out I, I don't know how they work over there but i remember i had been podcasting for about a year and a half at that point and and it was that same cavalier attitude of i'm gonna just try to be rich let me see what i could do in five years i'm just gonna try to do comics let me see and um i guess when i talk like that it just sounds like i just fell into it but it doesn't account for like the the obs OC, like the obsession like i'm just drawing over it like if i show you a picture of Wolverine with his foreskin and I just flick it out. You're like, oh, he just did that in two seconds. I'm like, I've drawn that like 600 times, you know, like I'm like killing myself over here to, so I, I would um, do these podcasts where I would talk for six hours straight with no commercial break. I wouldn't let people go to the back. And like the thing, the joke of it for me was nobody wanted to be there <laughs> except for me. I mean, awesome. My co-star, she's a porn star. She, she's kind of was down for like two, maybe three hours, but at hour six, she's like, Come, wh wh what the fuck are we doing here? You know? Um, and so to do the Howard Stern show and, you know, you know, they sort of gave me the heads up. They're like, if he likes you, I mean, if he doesn't like you, you'll be out of there in like five, 10 minutes. If he likes you, it'll go. And, and, you know, I did almost an hour. And so everyone came out and they're like, that was great. You know? And Howard came from behind his table and, you know, I always remember it. He just, for me, he's a true artist, right? The same way, like all the all the 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 lines he broke with with just how he was vulnerable and put himself out there, and he was, a, you know, a rebel. Um, I just and as he gets older, and my fear is that he's going to go off the air, and I hear him talking about his passions with um, with uh, with chess or or photography. I always push art onto people because art to me is a drug. Like if you can paint and you can draw and I don't give a fuck about if it looks good or if it has the right, you know, light source or it, it, it saves so many people's lives for you to draw something. And I and I fucking knew it. I knew that he has that in him because of the way he does his radio show and he just is brave and he'll just go there. I'm like, fuck. And like I just pushed it on him. I was like, dude, please let me give you art lessons. Please let me give you watercolor lessons. 
And he's like, no, 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 because he's a perfectionist. And I, you know, I find I find out now that he's like a fucking. I seen his watercolors. He's like a professional. Like he took that energy. But on that day, I mean, he is fucking killing it. Like I, 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 I see his watercolors, and I'm like, this guy took everything that he brought to his to podcasting. But now that he doesn't have to you know, impress all these people. And it's just the solitary, you know, art being an artist is a solitary sport. And it's just him in his room and his cats. It's he's killing it. Like, I love it. it I can feel his soul in it. But I remember that day because he came behind the table and he came up to me and I offered him the art lessons. And he's like, no, some, some other time when I, when I feel like I'm getting better, like you're too professional for me. And he just was like, I forgot the exact words, but it was something along the lines of like, you need to chill the fuck out. He's like, you, you're like, like, that was the greatest compliment. Like he could have, I could have ever got from anybody. I'm like the king of all media. The, the, the mics are off. We just did our segment is telling me like, bro, like you're fucking out of control. Like you're going to die or, you know, and I was like, yes, don't, don't you get it? That's what I want. <laughs> like, I want to lose it all. I want to hurt myself. I want it to end in a big flaming, you know? And I, I just left that serious building, like thinking like, Fuck, man. And, you know, uh, um, Jason Kaplan, the producer, they called me like uh, a few weeks later and I was like, you know, Howard 100 and Howard 101, like we have a lot of airspace to fill. Like, would you be open to like, and I was like, what? What the fuck? Like, I've only been broadcasting for one and a half years and I'm going to be on the Howard Stern. Like, I knew it. I knew I was like, I can fucking kill everything. I could get rich. I could be a, I could be Frank Miller. I could be Howard Stern. I could do anything I want. I'm the best because my mom told me so. And, uh, you know, that never happened. But uh, I, 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 the, the losing my mind part happened before. before. <laughs> um, um, but, yeah, I mean, that I, I end up losing myself in my art often. Like I go, I don't, you know, I go, oh, art school confidential, eight ball. Okay. I could draw. I think I could draw like that. Start going. <laughs> and it's like, I can't, it's like the classic, like, you know, ADD shit. Like I, 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 I so the, the real answer is I can't, I can't draw like that because I would if I could. And it's all this, you know, all these things that I got to keep working on of my, you know, and there's people out there that like me at my darkest because I'm, I mirror them like they're like oh Cho's out of control he's about to fucking go off you know the rails and and that mirrors you know I, I know that like when I'm getting all letters from guys in jail that like I'm probably not doing great in life like you remind me of me <laughs> like I'm serving three life sentences I'm like ah oh, shit man is this my core audience so I, I it's been a very hard struggle to you know to to you know you know as good painters to go from dark to light. Like I'm trying to go towards the light now. And even today, like the fucking background, I'm like, I'm going to show nature right now. I have like all this gross art back there. And I'm like, I'm going to prove that I'm a comic book artist. I'm like, no, I want to be in nature. You guys have the gross boxes in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so funny, man. Whenever I would like have a company over, I, I decided like I should get rid of like all the like ratty old boxes that are from the seventies and bought like a heap of white ones. So at least it like doesn't look that cruddy. Right. I like hearing all of this, David. I, I, I like the idea that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, whenever we all start making art kind of seriously, whenever we're, teenagers you know young people and it is angsty and i think we associate that mood as like that's one of the ingredients to making art and i'm not sure it is i think it's just an ingredient of being a certain age that also coincides with when a lot of us start making art and thinking about making art and then we 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 never make that separation or at least you know maybe not unless something traumatic happens and then in terms of like uh you know howard stern i think is a good example of you see it with companies like you need a certain type of mentality to build a company, you know, and, and think of like Howard Stern beginning of his career. Right. Like he is breaking down barriers and pissing people off and getting fired or threatened or whatever. But at a certain level, then you need a different type of leadership or in, in Stern's case, you need to be a different kind of person. You know, once you reach that level, you're no longer kicking the doors down. Now you're sort of you've made it. You've made this house right. that you want to live in you have to act differently because you don't want to destroy your own house necessarily. Right. And uh, companies do that though. Like you often hear that about like people that build companies. And then once that company's up and running, it's a different type of CEO that you need. Right. At that point. I mean, I mean my number one objective, if, if, if the question is, Hey man, 
you're wealthy enough to do anything you want. I'm like, well, I was poor and I had nothing to lose and I did whatever I want. So then what is the number one objective for today? It's always fun. I'm like, am I having fun? And the lesson for me to learn from, from Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird to Rob Liefeld is you have turtles, which is this billion dollar industry. Now you have Rob Liefeld, one of the founders of image comics, which is still here today. And you know, it's like in the top, they're the top three now, right? Image DC and Marvel. So Rob Liefeld has been off my radar for a long time until this new pouch character that, you know, it's the dumbest character ever that's making fun of himself. And it's like, why the fuck do all your characters have these huge pouches? Forget the character, just make tons of pouches. And it's funny. And I like went online and I tried to find like Rob Liefeld, you know, original pouch man for sale. Like it, it just speaks to me because it resonates how much fun he had doing that. All these motherfuckers that try to copy the the, the Adelson radioactive hamsters and the, the cold blooded chameleon commandos, like all those things were just trying to get the money. Right. When you hear the story of P Peter uh, Laird and Kevin Eastman meeting and, and trying to make each other laugh and go, we're not trying to start a billion dollar industry. We're just trying to make each other laugh and fuck around. And then that's how the turtles came about. It's it, that's the, the core that I try to get to every day. Not like, how is anyone going to like this? Is anyone going to listen to this? Is anyone going to buy this? Is anyone going to care? It's like, is this funny to me? Is this funny to the people I love? Are we making each other laugh? Are we finding joy in this? And, and, it's a good a good lesson for me to remember. I try to stay on that course of comics are supposed to be fun. They're supposed to be, uh, you know, I mean, it could be anything, but at, at the core of it, like the, the shit that I feel when, when, um, when I see Calvin and Hobbes or, or, uh, yeah, and I, and I'll, you know, I know you guys go deep on all the image stuff, but yeah, I, I, I never read Wildcat, Spawn, Youngblood. I have all those issues. What, what was Shadowhawk's thing that he breaks people's spines? Like I got th those guys suck at writing. Like I, 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 I young blood. They're like celebrities. I'm like, who? and then they're like, this dialogue sucks. This is like just, but I, I didn't care. The drawings were so fun that it just kept me in there, you know. And uh, um, one, one final, one final. Oh, I could ask you I, if if we're if we're turning the tables now. I got like a million questions for you. But <laughs> here's, I, here's, I know you got here's a, the one from dead guy coming. So. Here's a here's a here's a quick one, and and we don't have to. You don't have to give too personal or anything man but um anthony bourdain uh you know i read his books i i i sort of loved his art and in his books he often would talk about comics so i know he's a comic head and i know he had like some stuff at dark horse at dark horse and uh, even vertigo i think at one point um when you guys connected did you guys ever talk comics i mean he yeah you're right he fucking totally loved comics and He's, he's a storyteller and he ended up going towards more, you know, obviously TV and broadcasting, but he loved, you know, um, he, he would send me these drawings of himself at the darkest times of, of his life in the same way. Like he felt so much pain in, in his heroin addiction and his drug addiction that he would just draw himself like this goblin, like, you know, in his own shit and blood and like, like shooting up arrows, uh, arrows, um, needles. So, I mean, it was, uh, he used art he used comics to to come out of that and and and, and yeah i mean when i talk he, bourdain to me he's like a tv personality he's a famous person but to me he's an artist you know it's like oh who isn't an artist today i mean that guy was an artist the, the way he, he used words it was poetic and and the way he was almost everything i've talked about in this interview he was vulnerable and open and and you know the the thing that you there's like a type right after you start start reading like especially like Dan Klaus, Crumb, Joe Matt, like these kind of it's like this this self-deprecating, like this self-destructive, you know, he had that even as he was like this, oh man, you're gonna you're gonna get me to start crying right now. Um Yeah, I mean he's uh Yeah, fuck you, Ed. Um, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> so um, he he. Um, I I feel like I'm calling a lot of my friends during this time right now, and you know a lot of people are, you know they're 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 gardening, they're learning how to bake, they're they're doing new things that they've never done before, and um, 
this is like almost crack for comic book artists, you know, like they, they sound like heroin addicts, uh, like for real, like, you know, I, I'll call and it, they haven't come out in this. They're like the whole world's shut down perfect. And they're in their dungeon and they're just drawing. And, and I go, you got to fucking connect with people. I mean, we're, you know, we're social animals, like, and, and, and you, you have to feel, you know, like, like say, say I was Bourdain or say I was like the lead singer of like Backstreet Boys or, you know, it's like, I'm going to have problems that are completely unrelatable to most people. But does that mean I'm not allowed to talk about it or like every, you know, you know, being a Korean American and growing up, it's like, I can't even talk about racism towards Asians because at least we're not getting killed or I'm like, okay, so so everything I felt growing up, it's irrelevant because no one killed me. And that's that's when people put trauma as a competition. Oh, I, I didn't know this was a sport. Oh, you got beat by your dad once? Oh, I got beat by like, you know, I got gangbangers. It's like, what are we doing? A, a showing off our scars contest? Like, so everyone's going through something. Everyone's fucked up. If you're reading comics right now and you're like not five years old, some shit happened to you. You're fucked up. If you're a cop, some shit happened to you. If everyone had some shit happen to you, and if you don't have a place to talk about it or get it out, and for me, I used art, and and without art, I'd be dead right now. I know people say shit like that all the time. I promise you, I'd be dead right now. With without comics, without art as a place to. Shit is real, man. You know. I mean, it's, it's, this ain't, it's this ain't a joke. Life. It saved my life, and I I know. I fucking know it saved your life. I, like, I, I feel it when I read your guys' comics. I'm like, these fuckers, these fuckers love comics. And, and, and we say comics, but it's art. It's everything. It's art. It's writing. It's telling stories. It, 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 it encapsulates everything that I love, love about storytelling. And so without that, I mean, like, I feel sad right now. I just donated a bunch of money and all this art to, to try to help independent bookstores. But I mean, I'm sad right now. I mean, I'm, I know it'll shift and we'll adapt like everyone else and probably go digital. But I mean, it, it's I think of all the pain I've gone through in my life. And if I didn't have the Turtles, if I didn't have Batman, if I didn't have the Hulk, if I didn't have the Punisher, I'm like how ridiculous is Punisher? He's a skull on his chest and he kills jaywalkers. He kills everybody. But that's how I fucking feel. It's not OK to do that in real life. Like, but. You know, like like when I talked, I talked to this twenty year old kid who only watches incest porn. I fucked my brother. I fucked my. It's like you go to jail for that shit in real life, but it's fantasy. He's like, I need to watch this dad fucking his daughter. I need to watch that kind of thing, and I just, I, I don't know where I'd be. And it, it, it's like this art should never be censored. It should, it, if it's not for you, it's not for you. I used to. Um, I used to, uh, you know, to get to my house, I'd have to walk past this 7-Eleven where there's all these black kids that got out of out of uh, junior high. So I'm like 18 years old and they're like 14, 13 years old. And they would yell, gook, chink, they throw shit at me. And I, I was horrified. And and then one day I, I would try to skate past them quick or go on the other side so that I wouldn't get harassed. They try to knock me off my skateboard and, and uh, steal my skateboard. And I, and I fucking swung my skateboard and I hit one of them. And I went home and I, I started crying because I'm like, I just hit a kid. But even even though they attacked me and I didn't know what to do with that. So I made a comic. I made a comic. I made 50 copies of it. I sold it at WonderCon. And people were like, this guy's a racist. This guy's a fucking racist. And I go, I'm literally just writing exactly what just happened. And I don't know what to do with these emotions. I don't know what to do with the painful experience. I just so I'm trying to like use art to express it. I'm trying to like, I, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm lost. I'm hurt. I'm scared. And I don't know how to say that to anybody. I, can I tell my dad that? Fuck no. Can I tell my friends? Hey, a 13 year old black kid just try to, <laughs> you're 18 years old. Like, I, I don't know who to talk about it. So I'm going to try to make light of it by making fun of it, of myself and, and this thing. And, and, you know, it was 50 copies. Like, you know, in my world, I thought, Oh my God, people are calling me a racist. And it's, to, to, you know, with the internet now, everything exists, right? I told you this fucking horrible letter that I wrote to Joe, Joe Quesada like 20 years ago. You can find that. And people go, oh, you said this, you said that. And, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll quote Ad-Rock from the Beastie Boys. 
I'd rather be a hypocrite than stay the same person forever. Like you, you guys can go back a year, two years, five years, and you can find completely uh, conflicting things I've said. And you're like, man, this guy, I'm, I'm just, when I fail, when I fuck up, like, oh shit, man, I fucked up. My personality goes, I'm a loser. I'm a piece of shit. I'm no good. I don't want to get back up. But if I keep failing forward, if I get up again, I go, I didn't do my best yesterday, but I'm going to try again today. It's like, you know, I don't like that that stuff is out there, you know, like I'm like, fuck, but I can't also deny that that saved my life. How am I going to deny something that saved my life? Like, is it okay to laugh at like the pun, like the Punisher murders people. Batman is a billionaire that beats up fucking low income thugs. Like, that's not cool. Batman is not a cool person. He's a fucking asshole. And yet I fucking worship him. I have a Batman. I have like 10 Batman shirts. That's me like fucking, you know, co-signing and saying Batman's I'm okay with him. I'm okay with this guy using his fucking, you know, how much does it cost to go to ninja school? I'm sure it's really expensive, right? It's like, you're a billionaire. You can spend billions of dollars. You can buy a country. You can open up. He could... You're still fucking beating up fools in Gotham City when you could have built like colleges and scholarships. You could have had zero grants out your ass. You could have found the next fucking, you know, the next rubber crumbs and, you know, all that shit. And and yet I'm like, I'm OK with that. So I don't know. I'm I. Um, um, I, I, I want to fucking rep you guys hard. Can I be open, honest and direct with you guys? Sure. You guys need better merch. You guys fucking. You guys are artists and you guys fucking draw comic books. You guys are graphic designers. You guys need better merch. I went on the kayfabe site and I was like, I want to get something so I can wear a kayfabe hat or shirt every day. And I was like, I don't know about this one. I don't know about this one. Like you guys got to, I, I feel like after talking to you guys for a couple hours, I feel safe enough to say that without you guys telling me to go fuck myself. Um, you guys can still tell me to go fuck myself. I'm just saying, come on, man, bring it. Like, I want a fucking hoodie. I want to, you know, I want that shit. It's always easier to uh, take some constructive criticism because I could do something with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I listened to two interviews. I listened to the Toth one, the One Wizard Magazine one, and uh, the Mark Millar one. And I was like, I'm in. I'm in. I need to fucking rep some kayfabe shit. And I went on the merch site and I said, what the fuck is going on here? Dave, you guys get- are artists. Give us a little inspiration, and if we could see that Shadowhawk uh, shirt a little more clearly, maybe hold it up a little bit, that'll get the creative juices flowing. I mean, this guy, you know, speaking of Jim Valentino, he's, to me, he was the fucking weakest link in the image chain, right? Nobody talks about him like they talk about McFarlane or Jim Lee or even Rob Liefeld. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but... He has the biggest smile in that in that picture where it shows all the image he founders. He has the biggest smile, and you know, for me, I always keep my my. You know, I told you I don't read it, but I keep my Shadowhawk with my touch of silver. Um, <laughs> so, to me, like Will's Portasio, or or like I'm like, wait, all of this makes sense. Mark Silvestri, Will's Portasio, but Jim Valentino, like, what the? F- I mean, he must have like a big dick, or he must be like. Like something must be happening here. And I, I look back now and like I bought this Shadowhawk shirt 10 years ago as a goof. Like I'm like, I'm going to rep Shadowhawk, the, the weakest, lamest character out of the whole, you know. And I sit back and I look now and I go, man, there'd probably be no image without Jim Valentino. I mean, he's the one that was like pivotal to like shifting from like the just art to like great stories. And he's just he just. He just seems like a really down ass dude. He was like the underdog and I always root for the underdog. So now I'm proud to wear this fucking shirt, you know, <laughs> just by all anecdotal accounts. He, he's, he's the guy, he, you know, he's older than everybody. So he was able to bring a little bit of a mature space when, right. uh, when those boys are going crazy. Right. Jim, you got anything? No, I am. I'm good. The truth is, David, we have a million things, man, but we've been here for two and a half hours and I'm sure you got shit to do. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> put it this way, but it, uh, can we put a pin in it and maybe do it again in the future? Absolutely, man. I fucking, I, you know, the, my fear in doing these things is obviously you guys see that I have a big mouth. I can go off tangents for hours and hours. And I always end up saying something that hurts someone's feelings or I get in trouble. I feel like I was present and conscious enough today to not do that. But who knows? I'm sure there's, I'm sure maybe Jim Lee or Valentino will call me. And I've never met Jim Valentino, but. 
I'm sure someone will call me and tell me to go fuck myself. And then that makes me scared. And then I go hide for another five years. So let's do it again soon. Or in, I don't know, 2030 or I don't know, but I fucking love you guys. You're doing Odin's work. Doing big, 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 big. <laughs> how, how about this real quick? Are, are you, um, you can't, or let me ask a question. Uh, can you go back to Japan? Do you have any interest? Like, have you been back? I, since? I, I, I wasn't. So I, I'm not allowed back into Japan technically. And um, um, I guess I could talk to you about off this off the air. But I, I'll say this. I can go back to Japan. It's just a, a tremendous amount of work. Like I've been back twice since um, I've been arrested. And it was a huge deal. Like it, it involved like government and um yeah so it's and then, and then when i go I'm, I'm monitored the whole time like i, I have it's like uh, like i'm like out of jail again and i'm being watched every i gotta re- report in so i can go the the fast answer is yes i can go it's just very very difficult for me to go your persona looms large man like i spent a month over there like uh last year and they have weird rules you know like like i go to a gallery i could take a photo of this piece right here but the piece right next to it, you're not a- able to, and they will let you know, and they'll grab you. Yeah. And and I remember the Dave Cho story, and it was that sort of situation that got everything popped off. Like somebody grabbed you, and 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 shit went down, man. So like that loomed in my head. So I, I you're you were on my mind a bunch, and then I was thinking like, because I had such a great time out there, like it all worked out, and I was thinking like, man, it would be cool to go to like Sakaido in uh shinjuku to the art store with dave cho and see what the fuck he grabs <laughs> like what kind of brushes is he pulling man <laughs> yeah i mean i i fucking nerd out hard with art supplies and i always want to know what like other artists are using but at the end of the day you know if you're a dope artist it doesn't matter you could fucking paint with a stick in the ground like you know oh and you could probably also like at, at uh at um what the fuck was i mean that? check this out if you're in la i'll go to the uh japanese uh bookstore with you where they have all those art supplies if they still exist at the end of this that would that would, that would be sick man and if uh if we were in japan at the same time together sometime in the future it would be awesome to go to nakano broadway mall because on the fourth floor that takashi murakami dude has like bought the f- half of the fourth floor and yeah 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 and redesigned it to look like a mall from the 70s meaning he likes to smoke a lot and it has like cigarette machines and it's like real old school, but only the privilege get access, man. And I think you could be like my little, my little car. Yeah, we'll do that shit. That'd be yeah, funny Japan shit. Is, uh, Japan's fucking crazy. Um, um, can I, can I do I uh, I don't know if it's a shout out. Can I do a call to action for, to all comic book artists? Do some call to actions, drop some plugs, man. All of that. I have no plugs. I'm, I already told you I have. I have endless content that's never seen the light of day and may never see the light of day. And that's just because I'm a, I'm a scared person inside. I'm still a scared boy. But I guess, um, you know, as, I, as long as I'm on this platform and I know that, like, guys like McFarlane or, or Mark Millar is like, you guys inspire me to no end, all comic book artists, anyone who's brave enough to go down this path. And I just say, go fucking harder. Go harder. Like, if you... if you're out there. I, I, I'll let you know. I'm the guy buying everything. I, I don't judge. I buy superhero shit that's drawn well, that's drawn shitty. I don't care. I they're like, like, I sat here and I just talked shit about Jim Valentino, and I still bought his books, right? So I, I, I'm buying it. I'm watching. I'm listening. I'm begging you. I'm not asking you. I'm begging you. Fucking go hard as possible. Go fucking hard. Like when you sit there, like. Like, oh, I don't care about technique. I don't care about style. That's bullshit. Actually, I care a lot about it. But I'm saying, like, the books that 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 move me. Like, I'm not the biggest fan of like sagas, the art or preacher. Like, I didn't like, you know, Steve Dillon's art that much. But I, I loved it at the end. That's the thing is, if you have a good story and you put your heart into it and your passion, like, I can change. Like, I don't have to stay the same person forever. I could be like, fuck this, fuck that guy. I'm not a Valentino guy. Like, I fucking love Shadowhawk now, even though I still never read it. Like, I wear this shirt almost every day. Like, I, I rep this shit hard, you know? So I, I'm just asking you, as someone who's who's a misfit, who, who was, like, outcast and, and, like, drawing was your only skill or writing or telling goofy stories or you're the weird kid that everyone made fun of, you found this. 
you found this home in comics the same way I found it, the way Ed and Jim found it. So you're here now. You're accepted. We love you. The fucking freaks, you know, that's our tribe. Just go hard. Just like, don't, don't stay in that. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I, I feel it. Like I'm reading a book and I'm like, fuck, just, ugh, just go there. I know you're there. Like, and, and, and don't, you, you fucking pussy, you fucking pussy. Like, uh, this, this, this is me talking to myself, but so I'm, I'm putting that message out there. Whether you're a pussy or not, I still love you. I'm just saying as me, as a lifelong fan, I'll buy comics. I'll read comics to the day I die. Just take it there. And, and we're in a field that like has some of the greatest storytellers of all time, the greatest artists of all time, like the greatest artists in the world are comic book artists. The greatest writers in the world are comic book writers. And we're getting that respect today a little bit more than we did 10, 20 years ago. And so with that, those eyeballs on us, it's our duty. It's your fucking duty to go as hard as possible, to go to the scariest place. And, and you've explored, you're the guardian of the galaxy. You've explored the whole galaxy. Now go, now go in here, go to the scariest, darkest part in here. And I want to see that. I want to read, I want to cry. Just think of me reading your book, like crying for fear because I'm scared because I don't want my nipples ripped off crying because I feel emotions, because crying because I, I read a, you know, um, Daniel Warren Johnson, like extremity, and I'm crying reading that because of the bravery and these people and the suffering, like make me cry, make me feel shit. And, 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 and I believe in you. I, I know you can do it. You just got to try harder. That's it. Like just go there and that's it. That's a good message yeah, to, man, to, awesome. to, uh, to, to end this on. And I'm actually going to give a David Cho plug if he's not going to do it, man. <laughs> Everybody should go to his Instagram account. He's going out on, on the streets the very next day. He's critiquing the street art. Uh, he's got, for as many things as, as he has to say about comics and all that here, <laughs> he's got some things to say about the revolutionary type of graffiti, man. You guys are a little bit whack with the spray cans and you got to bring some, <laughs> some hardcore energy. He's going to give you some pointers how to do that. <laughs> Don't, I mean, don't you agree with that? I mean, I, I am like obviously making fun of it, but don't you think with Google and our entire like history of revolutions and protest art and the German Berlin Wall, like we have access to that and all you can come up with is a limp wristed anarchy sign? Like, like, come on, if it's a revolution, like bring it, like some shadows, some outlines. Anyways, I, I could, yeah, I could go. Go on. You, you triggered me to go off on that but <laughs> yes i am making fun of graffiti artists please don't come after me but at the same time once again same message for you try hard. try not even try like to, to kill yourself just this much try a little bit harder i'll notice and i'll appreciate it <laughs> i notice when people try even a little oh cool like i notice when people take time to do extra printing or better page quality or paper quality and all that shit like People notice those things. I have to assume as you as you disseminate your message and, and get the word out, I have a feeling maybe next week, week after, we'll, we'll see some stuff that gets the thumbs up from David Cho on the streets of uh, L.A. Yeah, and, 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 and to that, like, fuck that. You guys are, bit, like, I don't want you guys to spend any time doing merch. You guys out there that are listening that are fucking comic book artists, you guys design the T-shirts and the hats. These guys are busy doing God's work. You guys do the merch, man. You know what? You might be the guy to be able to push this over the tipping point because I've been calling a long time, man, for somebody to get cartoonist kayfabe tattooed on their forehead. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> and uh, nobody's done it yet. All these kids out there that don't that are disenfranchised don't give a fuck. Tattoo kayfabe on your fucking face, you fucking shitheads. Do it, man. Right there, right in the middle, not like on the side or like right here. Right there, kayfabe. Fuck you. Fuck yeah, dude. We'll send him a sketch. I'll send him a sketch or two after yeah. that. And some OG art, you know? David, it's been a pleasure, dude. It's 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 so uh, gratifying speaking to you. Nobody feels good right now. And uh, for the past couple of hours, uh, we, we just, we, we had a ball. I feel so fucking good right now. I, I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. I My favorite thing in my life is making comic book artists feel awkward. So thank you for letting me do that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for letting me feel my feelings, man. I didn't know I was going to cry today. I don't, I don't, you know. I wasn't trying to flex the Barbara Walters skills, man, but, you know, it's inevitable if uh, we keep doing these interviews like that. We're going to get those chops. Okay, I just remembered there's one thing I want to plug, yes. and I know this is, like, the fucking most awkward way to end an interview, is I, I'm a Star Wars kid, right? I, I first movie I saw in the theater was Return of the Jedi, and I'm, I'm in. Like, I'm in. 
And people are like, the last one sucked, the one before that sucked, the fucking Jar Jar Pango. doesn't matter if it sucks. Once you're a fan, that's what people don't understand, right? I was saying when they try to apply logic to it, it hits a different part. It's a feeling. So I don't care how shitty the Star Wars movies are. Oh, they should have done this and the, the deep analysis of fucking grownups. It's a fucking fantasy thing for kids, right? And yes, when I end your guys' interview by saying do better, do better, and JJ could have done better and, and Ryan Johnson, whatever. I'm a fan. I love it. With that being said, I felt so many fucking feelings with the last trilogy that I fixed it. And if you guys just go to YouTube and Google David Cho, Star Wars, a video will pop up. It's like the most passionate thing that I've worked on. Uh, some fan made the fucking animation to go with it, but I fixed all of Star Wars. So if you guys are listening right now and you're Star Wars fans, watch the David Cho fixing the Star Wars galaxy. And I'm telling you, man, just please. Like, I, I, I'm. it's like one of the things I'm most proudest of. And uh, that's the only thing I want to play. Watch it last night and there will be a description in the uh, video below. It's better than any Robot Chicken episode you'd ever watch. Thank you.